Hello and welcome back to Matt Hayes Tottenham Blog and to another Transfer Talk live stream. Uh, again today I'm just going to be going through the latest developments with the, the Tottenham transfer window and the things that we may be expecting to see happen over the next couple of weeks, both in terms of incomings and outgoings. Um, I'm also going to be taking your questions and comments in the, the live chat and I'm going to be going through um, as many of those as I possibly can. Uh, for the people watching on the live stream replay, um, there's going to be a couple of links down in the description. First of all, there's one for a Facebook group that I'm running. Um, if you want to go over there and join that, uh, do feel free. I'm also going to be doing a fantasy football league this season uh, for Tottenham fans, so the code will be down there. It's 8MTEKC, so go down, join that, and share it out to your uh, Spurs supporting friends and family. Um, I'm also going to be doing a giveaway when I reach 1,000 subscribers, so I'm about 80 away from that at the moment. Um, I'm hoping to get there before the end of this week, uh, so hopefully I can give out that jersey before the season starts. Um, so the, the topics I'm going to kind of be touching on today... Um, I'm going to talk about the, the latest news of Paolo Dybala that broke uh, late last night. I'm also going to talk about what that kind of means for our situations with Christian Eriksen and Giovanni Lo Celso. And I'm also going to mention the likes of Toby Alderweireld, uh, Ryan Sessegnon, Kieran Trippier and a few other uh, rumours that I don't think have much substance to them, such as like David Neres and Gareth Bale. So I just want to wait for a few more uh, viewers to come in here. It's going to remind you, this is a, a Transfer Talk live stream. I'm going to be taking your questions and comments uh, in the live chat, and I'm going to get through as many of those as I possibly can. Um, so as I said, in order to give away that jersey, I'm hoping to get to about 1,000 subscribers. So if you want to share out my videos and stuff like that to people who are interested in Tottenham transfer news, uh, please feel free to do that. We can get to 1,000 subscribers as soon as possible and hopefully get that jersey given out before the start of the season. Um, so a few people coming in here to the chat, we have Lucy H. Vids, Morris and It's Your Guy 101. Uh, so we're going to get started I suppose with the, the big news that we heard yesterday and that's Paolo Dybala. Um, if you saw my video this morning uh, you know that according to Sky in Italy, Paolo Dybala has said that he does want to stay at Juventus this season. Um, it's a bit of a blow to our, our transfer targets, our transfer hopes because when that news broke last Wednesday or Thursday that uh, Dybala was a target for Tottenham and that we were in uh, initial talks with Juventus over signing the player. Um, well, we did feel it was a bit realistic. It was something we are getting really excited about. He's, he's probably one of the best players in Europe uh, in terms of ability. He hasn't quite shown that form in the last couple of uh, in the last year or so because he's kind of been overshadowed by the likes of Ronaldo and Mario Mandzukic. Uh, so it was something we were getting excited about. It was a possibility that he would leave Juventus. Um, the first we kind of heard about his thoughts on this was that uh, he came back after the Coppa America um, and he spoke to Maurizio Sarri and said, look, he, he wanted to move on, uh, try and get a bit more game time somewhere else. And that really got our hopes up. That was quickly kind of crushed when uh, we we heard from Sky Sports that Juventus were interested in signing Romelu Lukaku from Manchester United. Um, they were willing to offer Paolo Dybala and a player plus cash deal uh, to get him to Juventus. And then when that, we, when that came out, we kind of thought, you know, that was the end of that. Dybala would be more interested in joining, uh, in joining Manchester United. We kind of gave up on it then. Um, after that, we heard Dybala had snubbed United. This was something we weren't really expecting, and it never really came from any reliable sources. But because there was just so many places saying it, we did kind of well. Personally, I did kind of feel that might have been the truth, and maybe this was going to be a transfer that the club could actually pull off. But um, at the moment, it's looking like that won't happen. Um, Paolo Dybala wants to say Juventus for the upcoming season, and while it's a big blow, I don't think it's I don't think it's a massive one because. He, he wasn't someone that we were realist realistically going to be signing. Um, you know, we thought Giovanni Lo Celso would be a more realistic and maybe a better target in there because he'd be a lot cheaper and he's, he's someone who does want to come and join Tottenham and he's, a, I think, a primary target that Mauricio Pochettino has identified. Um, so maybe it would be better if we do get Giovanni Lo Celso in. Now I see Carl asking here, Matt, any idea of when Lo Celso is coming to London? Um, I haven't heard anything about when he will be in London, but I do feel it will be very, very soon. Um, there's been no real progression in that deal over the last couple of weeks but it does feel like it's only a matter of time before he joins there are some sources claiming that he could be joining uh, as, as soon as this Tuesday so if if it is going to be done over the next uh, 48 or so hour, hours um, it, it's going to be really exciting and I think ideally Pochettino would want him in for that game against Inter Milan on the 4th of August maybe back at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium um, now Morris asking where would Lo Celso fit in posi position wise and I don't think in that mainly that trio we play behind the striker. I don't think it's going to be a case where there's three players that are prioritised in there. I think it's going to be massive rotation game after game because we'll have so much depth in there. You have the likes of Lo Celso, Eriksen, Ali, uh, Son, Lucas, Lamella. Um, so there's a lot of players who can play in that position and even Suzoko could be pushing on further this season with the signing of Ndombele. So 
Lacelso, uh primarily will play in that uh, three behind the striker, mainly sentry. Um, but he does also have that ability to play in a deeper role because he is uh, he can play as a box to box midfielder. Um, so he he fit really well into the squad, and I think because of his Argentinian nationality and all that stuff, and the way he's played with PSG, there is a lot of links there with Mauricio Pochettino, and they they both seem to want to work with each other, and it looks like that deal will get over the line sooner rather than later. The latest news about the fee that we're going to be paying is about fifty million pounds, which I think for a player of his quality and because of what Betis were looking for earlier in the window, I think it's an absolute steal, and we should be overjoyed to get a player of his quality for that amount of money. Um, and in this sort of market, it's it's not uh, easy to get a player as good as he is for that for that amount of money. I mean, you only have to look at the the other players that are being signed in the Premier League, of course. Uh, Danny Ceballos, even on a loan deal, cost Arsenal fifteen million pounds. Uh, they're signing Pepe for seventy million, and then you look at the likes of Harry Maguire. I know he's a different position, but he's he's a decent player, and he's going to United for maybe eighty million pounds. So in this uh, inflated market, it's it's looking like a really good deal for us, and one that will be completed. Um, Ishak is saying here there's only 10 days left though and Scott Parker has said he wants to keep Sessegnon I know these are comments that Scott Parker made I think after a preseason game that Fulham had yesterday and he said um, I don't think he said that he wants to he thinks Sessegnon will stay at, at Fulham uh, from his comments I kind of gathered he Sessegnon I think is injured at the moment so what Scott Parker said is he believes he will return to the preseason training and he will go back into training with Fulham but I don't know if he feels that Sessegnon will be there at the start of the season now, the deal with Sessegnon is apparently going to be £20 million plus Josh Onoma and George Kevin and Kudu. Um, Onoma was actually at that game yesterday that Fulham played pre-season. Um, and it's, it's believed that his uh, involvement in that deal is no problem and he's happy to go to Fulham. But it, it, it seems that George Kevin and Kudu is actually the one holding that deal up. He doesn't want to drop down to the Championship and he prefer a move to a, a European uh, top division club. Uh, for I'm not sure for pretty obvious reasons. Um... So with Sessegnon, I, d I do think that's another one that's going to get over the line um, sooner rather than later. £20 million pounds plus two players for him may be a bit excessive because he's not a player who showed a lot of quality last year. And I've, I've spoken about this a lot. There were a lot of factors that would have hindered his performances last season. Like they spent, Fulham spent over £100 million pounds in the transfer window and completely changed the face of that team. So in terms of chemistry with his teammates and sort of, sort of that team gelling together, it never quite happened. And Sessegnon was playing in a load of different positions. He was playing as a left back, as a left wing, a right wing. So there was never any consistency in there. And he would have struggled with that a lot. And also they had three managers throughout the season. Uh, it started with Slavisi Akanovic, had Claudio Ranieri in the middle. And then they ended the season with Scott Parker. So we can understand why Sessegnon struggled to get that form last season. But when he was in a team that was playing well, that was um, no, a, really, a team that really gelled together well in the championship season with Fulham when they, when they won the playoffs, he was without a doubt one of their best players. And... Even playing in left back, he showed a lot of attacking capabilities and he caused a lot of problems for teams. I think there was one game there, I forget who it was against, but he played as a left back and he scored a hat trick. So that kind of tells you all you need to know about him as a player. Uh, he's 19 years of age at the moment. So, as I've been saying, I don't think he will go straight into the first team as a starting player. Of course, at the moment, it looks like we will have Danny Rose and Ben Davis at the team come the start of the season. Um, when Rose was left out of the preseason squad, uh, according to Pochettino, it was. Uh, well, according to the club, it was to let him pursue a move away. But Pochettino was then speaking about it while he was in Asia. And he said, uh, if when he returns to London, uh, Danny Rose is still there, as far as he's concerned, he will be part of the plans uh, for the upcoming season. There's been nothing uh, really materialised in terms of a move away for Danny Rose. The only team that was interested there for a while was PSG. But that seems to have uh, fallen away to nothing pretty quickly. Um, Aaron McDonough saying, do you think Rose will stay? Um, I think he will at this stage to be honest because he's a player who who certainly loves the club and the club definitely the fans 100% love him back and there's been a few sort of iffy moments with a few interviews he's done um, where he's made some comments about the club that didn't go down very well but he's a player who at the end of the day when he goes out onto the pitch he gives 100% and he it, that usually uh, comes back in terms of quality and stuff like that so he's a player that we definitely love and I think because he's still at the club now with so little time left in the window I do think he'll be staying and that kind of begs the question, where will Sessegnon fit into this team? Because with Rose staying, uh, you, I suppose, assume that he is going to be our, our main left-back in the upcoming season. Um, and Ben Davis now having signed that new five-year contract. With Sessegnon coming in, I've said a lot with him, if he was going to be our starting left-back, his diversity in terms of where he can play would be a, lot, a big benefit to us. But with the way this is shaping up, I actually think maybe that could work out better for him because with the the depth that we have in our squad or that we should have in our squad going into the next season 
I think it'll be beneficial for him that if he's not going to be starting in that left back position, he can also play in more advanced roles and he can also play on the right. So I think for him getting into our squad, that could be that could be the key for him because I don't think there's going to be any uh, position that we can identify where he would be a starting player because there's certainly no position that he can play where he's our best player, but purely because of the quality we have in our squad. But I think getting him into those different positions and going forward, I, I think he could be a really exciting player to have at the club. And I've also spoken about that transfer fee and then when you look at what Arsenal are potentially playing for uh, Kieran Tierney. So at the moment, as I said, it's £20 million plus Anima and George Kevin and Kudu that we're apparently going to be paying for him. Now Arsenal are confident of agreeing a deal with Celtic to sign Kieran Tierney for £25 million. And looking at that and looking at the quality of two players, I, I think it is a bit disappointing that we haven't even tried to do something with Kieran Tierney. Because he's a player, as I said, who is better than Sessegnon. And for when you kind of look at the valuation of Anima and Kudu, it's not much off half the price that we'd be paying for Sessegnon. So I do think it's a bit disappointing we haven't even gone in for a Kieran Tierney. But having said that, Sessegnon will be a good player to get into the squad. And as I said, I believe that will be completed sooner rather than later. Um, Evan O'Driscoll saying Juve interested in Rose, include him in the, in the Dybala deal. This is something that was touched on by a lot of uh, news outlets over the last couple of days. Uh, Juventus are apparently keen on Danny Rose. They value him at about £25 million. Now, apparently there was something going on there that the two clubs were hoping that Juventus could sign Danny Rose for that £25 million and then Tottenham would go in for Paolo Dybala. And with that sort of relationship, relationship there, there might be an agreement in the Rose deal that we can knock a couple of million pounds off Dybala and maybe sign him for about £70, £75 million. Um, but now with these comments that Dybala has made that he does wish to stay at Juventus for the upcoming season to fight for his place, I do think any deal, uh, including Rose or Eriksson or a pure uh, cash deal to sign Dybala from Juventus uh, is highly unlikely at this time. And I think that was something that for a couple of days you know, we did feel could actually happen. It was, it was almost a dream like because he's a player who's, he was so, who, he's so, just so good basically. And he's, uh, he's, what, he's really wanted around Europe and he's one of the best players in the Italian league for sure. Um, but it looks like that one has quickly uh, kind of brought us back down to earth now and he will be staying at uh, Juventus for the upcoming season. Now Tottenham Reese here is saying, how do you feel that Poch said he would have left if he won the Champions League? Um, they're very strange comments that he made because I think it was after the quarter final he first said it. Um, if we if we do go on and win the Champions League, he might have to think about going home. And kind of throughout that, uh, the rest of the Champions League campaign, and even the start of this season, whenever he's been asked about it, he said, no, my comments have been misinterpreted. But then he's kind of gone on to say the same thing. So I don't know if there's something that's kind of been lost in translation. Uh, obviously his English isn't the strongest. But you can kind of understand where he's coming from because... If he has come into this squad, like at the end of the day, the, the team he inherited was it was an Andre Villas Boas team that was just had very little quality in it and was at best a Europa League team. And he's taken that and with the Daniel Levy budget, he's turned it into Champions League finalists. And when you kind of look at it that way, it's it's almost a miracle what he's actually done. And he's even done it with all this financial investments going in elsewhere in the training ground, in the stadium, and stuff like that. So you really have to commend him on what he's done and understand that. From his point of view, if he, in this five years, with the project that he's that he had at Tottenham, if he could go on and win the Champions League with that, in his mind, you'd have to, he would be wondering what he could do if he went to a team that had a lot of financial investment, such as Real Madrid or Manchester United. And you have to understand that he would be interested in something like that. If he could do that at Tottenham, what could he do elsewhere? So you can understand the comments that he made, but I think at the end of the day, he is invested in this project at Tottenham. And I, I do think it'll be a long time before we actually see him leave the club. Um, but they were not worrying comments but as I said before something we kind of need to keep an eye on because he has always made it clear that whenever he's been asked about that sort of thing he said in this moment he does see that he could spend his career at Tottenham but he never knows when his mind might change and tomorrow he could feel like he needs to try something new and he needs to move on but while I do think it is um, something that we do need to keep an eye on at the moment I'm not worried about him leaving the club especially when you look at according to the reports the financial investment that Levy's putting into the squad this summer and even the comments Levy himself made when he said where he's invested in the, in, the, in the club now, he's gone to the training facilities, he's done the training, or he's done the stadium. So the only place really left for him to invest is in the squad. And it's looking like that is going to be happening this summer with the signings we've already made and the few that are close to going over the line. Um, Spurs 13 saying football.london has said the Gareth Bale to China deal is off and we are interested. Um, I haven't actually seen that article yet. I know this is news that only broke in the last hour or so. Um, I first saw it on Sky Sports. They said that uh, Bale's move to join Jiangsu Suning in the Chinese Super League is off. 
um, his representatives were in talks with the club over the last couple of days and um, he was expected to sign a £1 million a week deal with Jiang Su Suning. Um, so I suppose when that first broke, you, you, you never really think a player would turn something like that down. So it did feel like that was a done deal and he would be joining them. But today we've now heard that he, he won't be doing that and he will be staying... At the moment, it looks like he will be staying at Real Madrid for the upcoming season. It was Marca who said that he would be staying. Um, so just trying to find here the football that one an article there that you were talking about. Um, I I don't think he's someone that the club would uh, have maybe as a prime transfer target. Maybe if that Dybala deal now has fallen through, it could be something they could revisit. But I feel like financially he's not a fit for the club at all. And in terms of that philosophy and stuff that Pochettino has... Um, I don't think he's a player because he has that ego and he, he's not as much of a team player as you might uh, expect him to be because of what he's shown at Real Madrid over the last couple of years and some of the comments he's made. So I can understand if Tottenham aren't interested in him. And in order to get him in, we would ha have to absolutely smash that wage structure that's in place. Because even at the moment, he's on £600,000 a week at Real Madrid. So um, I personally don't think that is a deal that could go through. But London are a very reliable source. Um... So if, if they do feel that Tottenham are interested, I, I would believe that. Um, but realistically, I don't think it's a deal that will go through this summer. I'm just trying to get the article here to see what um, what's going on here. Um, so they mentioned here the comments that Mauricio Pochettino made when he was in Asia. Uh, he was asked about transfers and the chances of Bale returning to the club. And he made those comments that he's not in charge of transfers. He doesn't know what's happening. Um, I don't know if that was because he was in Asia or if it's a general thing. He's not involved in all, at all in the transfer dealings. Um... But he said the person you need to ask is Daniel Levy. And I'm sure Levy was actually asked about that in the AIA press conference. But um, he, you know, like, people like that don't usually like to speak about specific transfer targets. Like if teams like Bayern Munich sometimes do that, but it's a very rare thing to see. Um, no, this isn't loading at the moment. But, I mean, if, if, it, if he is someone we're interested in, I, d I don't think that's a bad thing. Because he's a player who, on his day, shows a lot of quality. And even though he is injury prone and he's maybe pushing on now towards the kind of final years of his career, I think he's thirty at the moment. He's he's past his prime and all that. Um, I I wouldn't be upset if we brought him in, but for me, he wouldn't be one of the main transfer targets. Like personally, I would prioritize Giovanni Lo Celso in in that kind of area of the pitch. But I look if we if we get him in, it's going to be a good signing. And I mean, we we always kind of hope that when he did go to Real Madrid. Um, he would someday return to Tottenham and I think he said himself the only Premier League team he would return to would be uh, Tottenham and if that happens look I'm, I'm not going to be upset about it um, now someone asking here Arsenal buying Pepe haha they need a defence idiots that's Chad and that's so true Arsenal their defence has been like one of the worst definitely the worst in the top six one of the worst in the top half of the table over the last couple of years and I said it yesterday I'm so confused as to why they're investing so heavily in that attacking line that they have because they have such good players up there already, like the likes of Aubameyang, Lacazette, Mkhitaryan, Ozil when he plays well, and they got Granit Xhaka, who at times does show a lot of quality in those attacking positions. And like the only defender they've invested in this summer is William Saliba. Now, that is one that Tottenham were interested uh, in, but they, they pulled out of the deal because they didn't want to send him back on loan to St. Etienne. And you'd feel that Arsenal would be in even more of a position where they wouldn't want to loan a centre-back back to the team where he is, because... With Lauren Koscielny leaving at the moment, the, play the only players they have in there are Rob Holding, uh, Shkodran Mustafi and Socrates. So they're in a really bad position in that area of the pitch. And the fact that he's gone in, that they've gone in and invested £30 million in a centre-back and then sent him back to where he was for a year. And now they're going in apparently buying Pepe from Lille for £70 million. With the fact that their transfer budget, well it's supposed to be heard their transfer budget was only about £50 million. So they've obviously gone over that already. It's, it's so confusing. And even with the Kieran Tierney signing, like they've got a few players like Nacho Monreal and Saeed Kalazanac who can play in that left-back position. And it's a really weird transfer strategy that they have. And I mean, I'm, I'm happy to see it. Like <laughs> they're, going to be, they're going to really struggle getting into that top four in the coming season because they are going to go, they are going to score goals, they are going to beat teams. But when they get to those games that, you know, like kind of really even games and you, you feel like it's the fine margins that will define it, they're not in a good position to, to win games like that because they're so leaky at the back. And Bern Leno kind of saved them a bit last season with the, the quality that he showed in goal. But their defence is so leaky and it's it's just not a top four defence. It's not a Champions League defence. Um, and I suppose with, when you're looking at the squad as a whole, maybe the Europa League is where they belong. And it's where they might be for the, uh, a lot of time coming f going forward. 
Um, Bradley asking, should we make a move for Zaha? Um, I, I personally don't think that's a move that uh, we should go for because the likes of uh, Giovanni Lo Celso and if football that London are saying Gareth Bale, him as well, they're, they're better players and it would be similar amounts of money needed to bring them in. Now the latest on Wilfred Zaha is because of Arsenal's uh, interest in Nicolas Pepe, they will not be pursuing a deal for Zaha. But Everton have now made a bid for Wilfred Zaha, believed to be worth about £55 million. Pounds. So I think it does feel like Zaha will be going to Everton. Um, even if he wasn't, I don't think that's a move we should go for. Um, he's a player who, as he obviously has a lot of quality, but he's just really inconsistent. And I don't think he's someone that would fit into our squad well. Um, so I, I wouldn't be too disappointed if we didn't go in for him. Um, Jimmy Page is saying, do you think Lo Celso is more important than getting some quality fullback? So I could be wrong, but I feel like he's being hyped up a bit too much. Um, personally, I do think that ideally we'd sign a fullback this summer. Now, Sessegnan is, of course, a left back, um, but the position that we should be prioritising, not even just in the defence, but in the squad as a whole, is the right back position. It was one of our weakest uh, parts of the team last year, and with, I suppose, our starting right back and Kieran Trippier having left now, I do feel like that's a position we desperately, desperately need to invest in. But if Sky Sports are to believe Tottenham are not looking to sign a right back this summer, um, the one player that identified as a potential signing is Hiroki Sakai. Uh, he's a 29 year old right back from Marseille. But the club ideally wanted a player, a right back under the age of 23, but they haven't identified someone there. And they seem to have lost interest in Hiroki Sakai. So I think, it, personally, I would rather the club prioritise that position. Because we're always talking about this strength and depth, which don't get me wrong, is crucial to being a successful team. But first of all, you need to focus on that first 11 and you need to make sure that's as strong as it can be. And at the moment, I'm not sure it is because of that right back position. It is the only position I do think isn't as strong as it should be, but it's still important because in the system that we play, whether it's a 4 2 3 1 or the 4 1 2 1 2 that we saw against Manchester United, the, the full backs are so important to our play and I feel like it's a place we should invest in. The players that we have there at the moment, uh, Serge Aurier is not the player that we were expecting when he got him in from PSG and he's never hit any form and he's just been like the quality he's shown has not been there but he's been making stupid mistakes like he's been rash defensively remember his debut against West Ham he put in that horrible challenge uh, that gave away a penalty in the first half and I think he got himself sent off in the second half um, and there was other games where he had uh, you know three foul throws in the half and for I know we didn't pay a lot of money for him but for the investment and the fact that we bought him from a team like PSG you'd expect a lot more from him and he, he just should be better than he has been. Now, Juan Foyth, I think, is a really exciting right-back prospect for the future, but at the moment, I don't think he's uh, good enough to be a starting right-back. Of course, he played there for Argentina in the Copa America, and from what I've read from Argentinian fans, they were happy with how he did. And then Kyle Walker-Peters, I don't think is at that level yet. I think he could benefit from a loan move or uh, get a bit more game time in the maybe the under-23s, the reserve team, or something like that. So I do think we should prioritise that. But what you're saying about the potentially being hyped up a bit much, I suppose maybe there could be some sense of truth to that because at the end of the day, the majority of Tottenham fans haven't seen him play. We haven't, you know, the majority of us don't watch the likes of the French League or the Spanish League or the Europa League where he played last year. But having looked into him a bit myself, I do think his his numbers do say a lot. He is a quality player and he plays in that position that is so important to our team, kind of in behind the striker. And the style of play that he has, he's going to fit really well into our side. He's a very similar player to Christian Eriksen. Um, but he also has the ability to play in a deeper role, which Ericsson has been forced to do in the past, but he hasn't quite had the defensive uh, capabilities to do to do an effective job in there. But also, Lo Celso has a bit more pace than Christian Ericsson. I think that's something that Ericsson lacks in his play, so maybe uh, Lo Celso will offer that, uh, that bit that Ericsson doesn't. So I don't think he's hyped up too much. I think there, is, there will always be, when you're signing a player like this, there will always be a bit of, a bit of maybe overexcitement but I personally don't feel like Lo Celso is being hyped up too much. Um, Raw Dog asking, what do you think about Tagliafico? Um, he's, he's a really good player. Um, he's, he's a left back. I think, does he play with Ajax at the moment or has he left them? I'm not too sure where he is at the moment. But um, I do think he's a great player. But I mean, there's been nothing uh, to suggest that we are interested in, in him this summer. I think the price that he would go for at the moment might be a bit too much for a fullback because he's not in demand, but he's a player who a lot of teams are keeping an eye on. Um, and I think realistically he wouldn't be a target for us this summer but if he did come in I think he might be a better option than Sessegnon in terms of the pecking order I think he'd be ahead of Danny, uh, ahead of Ben Davis but I don't know where he'd be there with Danny Rose and I'm sure if that is someone the club are looking into that's something they'd be thinking about is he better than the, the starting left back we have at the moment and I'm not sure that he is um, 
uh, Luke Cage saying Danny Olmo any news Matt um, that one seems to have petered away to nothing um, there was a lot of excitement about this about maybe a month ago um, I made a video about it myself with Tottenham Reese who's here in the chat um, and we had heard that we had actually agreed a deal for him but that seems to have fallen away to nothing pretty quickly he, he's a player I was a bit excited about even though he does play in the Croatian league with Dinamo Zagreb he's not playing at the highest level but his numbers say a lot um, and played in that Spanish national team he of course was part of that team that won the European Championships over the summer um, he's a player I would like to have seen um, the club at least go for if not sign but I don't think that's going to happen this summer that's one we can probably forget about um, Kyle King saying this also in my opinion is going to be best signing ever witnessed we'll have to I'm not sure what that oh, we'll, we'll have too much for Liverpool surely um, yeah I think that's as I've said a lot Liverpool's midfield is probably the weakest area of the pitch they're, they're very solid in there but they don't really have a creative spark with you know, the likes of Coutinho that they had before I think that's something maybe that's where they were behind Man City last season and while I'm not saying our squad is anywhere near Liverpool's I mean we're what 24 What would you consider a very good transfer window? Um, I think getting the Lacelso and Cessnion deals over the line with who we've already signed in, in Dombele and Jack Clark and then keeping a hold of Alder Royard and Ericsson for me would be the perfect window. And I know maybe we'd rather get players like Paolo Dybala in, but in terms of realistic expectations and I suppose just getting things done as quickly as we possibly can, um, signing... Celso and Cessnion and keeping Oliver Royal and Ericsson on top of what already has happened and maybe getting rid of few, a, a bit of that dead wood like Anaman and Kudu who could be part of that Cessnion deal um, and maybe a few more players in there maybe getting rid of one of our holding midfielders that wouldn't be getting as much game time like Eric Dyer or Victor Wanyama I think personally I would see that as a good window but I mean anything can happen in the last 10 days that we have here because you know Tottenham like to do a lot of business late on and with the the European windows, like the Spanish, French, German and Italian windows, they're staying open till I think the 2nd of September. So for almost a month after our window was closed, we could still see departures, which I think is a, a really stupid thing that was done on the Premier League's part. Because when that uh, when they made that window close before the start of the season, the thinking was when the Premier League managers voted on it, what they want when they start the season is a squad that they know they're going to have. They don't want for the first uh, four or five games, they don't want this... Uh, all the rumours and all the speculation around the players what they want is a squad that they know they're going to have until the, the 1st of January at the latest so it's I think if this was a thing that was going to happen I think it is a good idea having that transfer window finishing before the season starts for a, a number of reasons but specifically that one but if it's going to happen I don't think it was a job that the FA should have done I think it was more something UEFA should have done because at the moment it's like I know there are 19 less teams that an English club could sell to but there are some of the biggest teams in the world that could still buy their players and after we can no longer invest in players. So I think it's a really stupid thing that has been done. Um, but look, we have to... I'm trying to improve the connection here. We have to look at... I suppose we're not selling the best players in our squad. We're not selling the likes of Kane, Ali, Eriksen, uh, Harry Winks, uh, Luke, Son and Lucas especially, Larice. We're not selling those, those best players in our team. We're selling the ones that are not... They're not adding much to our squad, like Trippier, like Janssen. So I think for us, even last season when we didn't sign any players, it wasn't as bad a window as some people were thinking because we held on to those players that we had. And I think that's something very important to look at uh, from a Tottenham point of view. Because we're known as a selling club, I think holding on to our players is um, could be considered a good window for us. Um, Delboy here saying, apparently if Rose stays, uh, we will wait till next season to get Cessnion for free on a, on a separate deal. I, mean, I, haven't, I haven't actually heard anything about that, but I do know Sessegnon has one year left in his contract and he has refused to sign one uh, with Fulham, so that could be a possibility. And it is looking like Rose will stay uh, this summer because of the comments Pochettino made about him still being at the club when uh, when they returned from the Tour of Asia. So, I mean, if that does happen, it, w it would maybe be a better idea because at 19, it may be better for him to stay at Fulham and get a year's more game time in him and come to us when he's 20. Um, so... While I would like to see him sign this window because it feels like we've been promised so much in this window and so far it hasn't lived up to that expectation but it still has the chance to do so with the likes of Celso and Tessian potentially coming in and I would expect at least one more signing. Um, while I would like to see him come in this window it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if he stayed at Fulham for another year and uh, we got him on a free next year but that's only me. Um, now 
the Toby Oliver Ireland situation is one that's very, very interesting. Oliver Ireland had a £25 million release clause in his contract up until two days ago, and somehow, for some reason, not one team triggered it. £25 million for a player of his quality, certainly one of the best centre backs in England, if not the world. Um, it's absolutely baffling as to why a team hasn't come in for him yet. Um, he's personally, I think what's going to happen there is he will stay at the club for the upcoming season and join Ajax on a free next summer. Personally, that's what I think will happen. But there's a few um, fairly reliable in the nose. There's one on Twitter and there's one who has a blog on Blogspot who both said they expect Oliver Oyer to sign a contract. So at the end of the day, uh, I mean, if he does that, it's, it's going to be much better for us. But if it's going to be a decision between selling him this summer or letting him go for free next summer, I think, as strange as, as it sounds, letting him go for free could be the better option. Because we need to invest so much in our squad this summer, getting in £25 million for him the, the money isn't there to get a suitable replacement. So I think if we invest in what we need to do this summer, let them go for free, and then we'll have a new budget next summer that we can then uh, invest in a in a better centre-back than what we would get now. Um, Tottenham Reese asking, how is Nkudu Deadwood? He started one game last season and got one assist. He's only 25 and he's fast as hell. We should give him another chance. Um, he's Deadwood because he's only started one game. He's someone who's on the wage books who isn't adding, who isn't adding anything at all to our first team. He only got in there because of the amount of injuries we had. And I know he had a good impact getting that assist against Harry Winks, the late winner against Fulham. But, as you said, I mean, he's 25. And what has he done for us so far? He's he's not someone who's going to be in our first team. He's certainly not someone who's in Pochettino's plans. So, he's on I mean, he's on our wage book and we're getting absolutely nothing back from him. So, ideally, sell, sell him and get a bit of money in for him and maybe we can reinvest that somewhere else, put it towards the Lacelso deal or the Sessignon deal. Or, fingers crossed, it won't happen. But if it does, the Dybala deal. So... I, I personally think he should go at the moment. Um, Faisal asking, Matt, do you think if Ericsson and Toby and Rose stay, we won't sign anyone else? Um, no, I think we will. I think regardless of those players, I think Aselso and Sessignon will come in this summer. Um, and as I said a second ago uh, from Darren's question, that's the ideal summer for us. Keeping those players that we want to keep and getting the players we want to get. I mean, what, what more can we ask for? Um, so I think I do think the three of them will stay and I do, do think we will get Sessignon and Aselso. So it's, it's shaping up, as I said, to be a really exciting window that's promised a lot so far, but hasn't yet lived up to that expectation. But I think it's only a matter of time before it does. Um, now, Finn here is asking, what do you think about Lo Celso being in Cardiff yesterday? Um, I didn't actually know Lo Celso was in Cardiff yesterday. Um, Ishak saying, I don't know if it's true, but I heard that Lo Celso was in London. Um, I actually haven't heard anything about that, but um, it can only be good news if it is true. Um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that, but I'm, I haven't heard anything about it so far. Um, regular Joe saying, Matt, do you think injuries will force Real Madrid to move for Eriksen rather than sell him now? Or rather sell him now, to be honest. Um, I don't think that's something that will happen. Um, when Marco Asensio picked up that awful injury against Arsenal in the pre-season at Friendly, he ruptured his anterior cruciate ligament and it's probably going to be out for the entire forthcoming season. I thought that would have a big effect on Arsenal's move for Danny Ceballos, but that hasn't happened and it has gone through. So I don't think Real Madrid will... They're not the type of club who will buy because they have an injury. They're not someone who, they're not a team who needs to buy because of one or two injuries. But having said that, at the moment, their um, their centre mid main target is Paul Pogba from Manchester United. Um, so if they are going to invest in one there, I imagine he would be their first choice. And if not, they may revisit the Eriksson deal. Um, apparently, um, Zinedine Zidane doesn't want Christian Eriksson in the squad. He's not a target for him. He's not someone that he'd like to see at the club. But I'm sure, as a last resort, he, he's not a bad option to have. And maybe um, maybe they could revisit that if the Paul Pogba, Paul Pogba deal doesn't happen or if he moves to Juventus or something like that. Um, Jimmy Page saying, you're not going to get anything out of him if you don't play him. But I'm not Potch and don't see what happens in training. I um, don't know if that's about Ericsson now or in Kudu. But that, that's a good point to make. Like we see All we ever see is the 90 minutes that the players give on the pitch. We don't see what happens behind the scenes. We don't see like who Pochettino... Uh, thinks is doing the best in training or who gives the most in training and at the end of the day performances do have to be rewarded but also effort in training has to be rewarded and that's something that Pochettino sees that we don't so as much as we can criticise team choices like we did in that Champions League final um, at the end of the day Harry or Mauricio Pochettino has a better insight into everything that's going on at the club and as with transfers uh, we do just have to trust Poch's uh, instincts because at the end of the day it is, what, it is the reason that we are here talking about the likes of Lo Celso, Dybala if it wasn't for him, I mean, we could still have a team with Stephen Cocker and Kyle Naughton in, in our defence. So we we absolutely have to trust Pochettino 100%. 
Um, and there's no reason why we should be sitting here criticising him. And the same with Daniel Levy. He has angered us a lot in the last couple of years, an awful lot. And maybe he's doing it a bit this summer as well. But at the end of the day, it's his business, uh, his business knowledge and experience and stuff that has gotten us now to a position where we have some of the best training facilities in Europe, where we have one of the best stadiums in Europe that is attracting players like Tangi and Dambele. And as much as we like to complain about Daniel Levy, he's the one who saw Mauricio Pochettino uh, as a manager at Southampton and thought he's something that could do something for us at Tottenham. So as much as we do like to criticise them, at the end of the day, they are the sole people that we have to to thank for the position that we're in at the moment, talking about these transfers, talking about uh, being the best team in North London, being a team who are consistently in the Champions League, having just lost the Champions League final. So as much as we like to criticise them, we 100% have to trust them and just believe that they know what is best for the club because their track record shows that they do. Um, Thomas asking, what's your prediction for when we get Lo um, as I said, I think he's going to be. Um, there's not going to be anyone in that sort of area of the pitch that's going to be absolutely our first player uh, down in the team sheet, game in, game out. There's going to be a lot of rotation in there, and it's something that Pochettino certainly identified last season as a problem, and rightly so because we were, had so many players that were being relied on uh, at the weekend and then playing midweek for weeks on end, and it culminated in a lot of injuries and uh, form dropping and all that stuff. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of rotation in those areas with Lacelso, Eriksson, Ali, uh, Son, Lucas, Lavella. Um, but I think Lo will get a lot of game time, as, as, as I suppose they all will because of the, the sheer volume of games that we will, we will be playing with the Champions League and the domestic cups as well. Um, Bradley saying, Matt, what do you think of Trippier's comments about things happening behind the scenes and he just had to leave Spurs because of that? Um, I think those comments have been completely blown out of proportion. What he said was, um, he, he was kind of asked about his reasoning for leaving Tottenham. He said there were a number of things, but there were things going on behind the scene that kind of, he, I, I'm not sure if he said force him out of the club, but the media have completely blown, blown it out of proportion and saying um, there's unrest in the Tottenham dressing room, that's why Trippier left. There's a number of things that could have been, like Pochettino might have come to him and said, look here, and we're looking to sell you this summer, uh, you're not in our plans going forward, and that could have been something that happened behind the scenes. It could have been Pochettino saying, uh, we're trying to bring in a right back and you'll be second choice, or Aurier is going to be your choice ahead of you, and that could have forced him to leave. There's an, any number of things that that could have been uh, in relation to and the fact that the media have first the first thing they've done to is uh, unrest in the dressing room um, just tells you all you, re- all you really need to know about their kind of approach to covering Tottenham news as we've known in the past uh, they're not particularly they're not particularly fans of Tottenham I suppose um, Delboy saying I think Levy has taken us as far as he can now we need to take the step of spending big money like the others I suppose that is a fair thing to say. Um, if we do want to com- compete uh, consistently with those big teams, maybe it is best to spend like they do. But I am I personally am a big fan of that uh, sort of opinion that Levy and Pochettino have, that they're not going to spend for the sake of it, and they're only going to spend if it can improve the squad. Um, there are a lot of teams who just like to buy, 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 like United, Real Madrid, Bayern Munich, and while some of those deals do work out well for them, um, there's a lot of money that's going to be lost and I think Real Madrid and United do have the funds there to make risks like that but Tottenham don't have the money to just go and spend it and hope it works out I think it's a, a really good tactic to have that they're only going to spend when it can improve the squad and Pochettino used that as a reason for the poor summer last year um, and I think if things don't go our plan don't go to plan this summer I'm sure that'll be something that'll be brought up again but I do feel like Levy will spend the money when he absolutely has to and when it will improve the squad as he said himself in the that press conference after agreeing that AIA deal, he said the only place left for him in, left for him to invest is the squad, and it's something that he's looking to do uh, sooner rather than later. Um, Jimmy Page saying we don't have the money though, though, and we have uh, a decent new squad, and that is true. The some of the players that have been brought through that academy are future first team players without a doubt. Like you look at the likes of Troy Parrott, uh, Harvey White, and Jaffa Tanganga, who were all exceptional over the uh, tour of Asia. And that, that first game we played against Juventus last week, um, there was 10 academy graduates playing in that game when we beat one of Juventus' strongest teams. I know two of them were Harry Kane and Harry Winks, but there were so many young players in there, all of whom were exceptional throughout the game and made Juventus look like a bang average team. Um, so we do also have to think that we do have a, a youth system there that not a lot of teams have. Like Maybe in the top six, United are the only other team that would have players coming through the academy like that. You know, Man City just buy, Chelsea just buy. There are a few players coming through now and it might be a thing that Frank Lampard tries to implement there, but at the moment you can't say they have a decent youth squad. So we have a lot more players coming through. Like Personally, I would put our youth system up there with the likes of Ajax 
uh, and Southampton in the, the players that they do develop and that's something that we do need to take advantage of and we need to try and get those players up through the system as much as we possibly can and in positions maybe now like we have looking for a Harry Kane backup maybe it's better to use Troy Parrott and not go and invest 30 or 40 million in a player to do that um, so that youth squad is definitely something we need to, to take advantage of basically um, Delvoy saying I heard from a reliable in the know that the thing behind the scenes was the fact that Trippier played the third place game in the World Cup while injured this was after Poch told him not to therefore ruining their relationship um, that again that could be something that is true I mean that third place playoff it's I mean it's not something teams usually put out their, their strongest lineup and Trippier haven't been one of their best players in the World Cup to play in that um, so maybe that could have been it it seems like a, a long time ago for it to have an effect on it now um, I don't think Trippier had many injuries throughout the season, but you know maybe it could be. Um, now Chad saying predicted lineup against Aston Villa has only Ndombele as a new inclusion. Um, that that's true. I mean, um, we we never really felt, I suppose, in the last couple of seasons, we never felt that we did need to go out and buy six or seven players to improve our squad. It always kind of seemed like we're one or two players away from making that step up to the biggest teams in Europe. And while Ndombele, it is disappointing that. Again, given what this window has promised, that Ndombele is the only new player looking to be playing against Aston Villa at the moment. I do think there will be num another number of players in there. And with the fact that there is 10 days left and what Levy likes to do in the window, I wouldn't be getting, I wouldn't be panicking just yet. Um, and I wouldn't be getting angry at him or Pochettino. Um, but as, as you say, at the moment it doesn't look too great that he's the only new addition in there. But there's, I mean, 10 days in a transfer window is a lot of time, especially when it's coming towards deadline day. Um... Chad saying, what about rumoured Kai Havertz as a new transfer target? Um, I haven't seen any rumours about that yet, but if it is something that the club are interested in 100%, that is an unbelievable deal to go for, to go for. Kai Havertz plays, I think, with Bayer Leverkusen at the moment. He's a young German attacking midfielder um, who is seen as one of the hottest prospects in Europe at the moment. Uh, his numbers with Bayer Leverkusen are absolutely insane. Um, he's, you know, I think he's only 19 or 20. Uh, he is one of their most consistent players and he has been links with the, linked with the likes of Bayern Munich and Real Madrid uh, very very recently and just looking him up here uh, he's 20 years old a German professional footballer who plays as a midfielder for Bayer Leverkusen and the German national team and the first thing you see here uh, an interview from Lars Bender the Leverkusen captain and uh, one of the best midfielders in the Bundesliga he just said Kai Havertz is a blessing um, now in, in uh, an article here from Inside Football um, about Kai Havertz being an Arsenal and Tottenham target and what he has said about it. Um, uh, Boyer Leverkusen, oh, it's about Kevin Volland, a, a striker for Leverkusen. Uh, he's heaped praise on Kai Havertz, who has been linked with Arsenal and Tottenham over the, the past window and has admitted it, it is inevitable that he will eventually leave Boyer Leverkusen. Um, sorry, no, it's just the 20 year old is widely regarded as one of the brightest prospects in Germany and enjoyed a spectacular campaign with Leverkusen last season. Um, and here we go, as a midfielder playing in the Bundesliga, Havertz netted 20 goals in all competitions and chipped in with 7 assists for his teammates as he helped his team to Champions League next season. Um, now what Valland has said about Havertz, uh, for us as a team, Kai is outstanding. I've followed, him, I've followed him since he came up from the youth system. Uh, he continues to, to develop at a top level. The increase in performance last season was emblematic of his footballing quality and personality. So coming like coming from players like Lars Bender and Kevin Volland, they have so much uh, hope for him as a player going forward and do feel like it's inevitable that he will leave Bayer Leverkusen. Uh, this this window, I don't think he is someone we will sign, but going forward, he could be a great transfer target to have if the moves for La Celsa really Bala don't go through. Um, he's a really exciting prospect, and it's it, in my opinion, it, it is only a matter of time before he is seen as one of the best players in Europe and he's playing for one of the top, top teams. Um... Uh, regular Joe saying so we should buy players like United Pogba Sanchez Fred no thanks no that's not what I said I said we shouldn't do that because they're investing so heavily in players because they do have the money they're going in and as you said those players you mentioned they're not players who've done well at the club so I said we absolutely should not do that and I do agree with Levy and Pochettino's outlook that they should only invest on players that they know are going to improve the squad so I absolutely do not think Tottenham should uh, should try and replicate Man United's transfer strategy uh, Jimmy's page saying Ndamale looks uh, seems like a great signing though and it's just good to see a new record signing the quality that he showed in that the half that he played against or the half an hour he played against Juventus and the few glimpses we saw of it against United he's definitely a really good signing and as you said it's great to see the club break a record transfer signing um, 
and Ndombele having attracted interest from the likes of Man City and Re- and uh, Juventus, I think he's a great signing to have in the club, and it's a big statement signing as well, which we were kind of hoping Paolo Dybala would be that, and I'm going to keep coming back to him because he is kind of the, I think Dybala is the benchmark of where we, we, we would hope to be at the moment in terms of the players that we can attract to the club, um, but uh, yeah, Ndombele, a fantastic signing. And he's someone that's going to be a massive addition to our team this season, especially in terms of the way he plays so similarly to Moussa Dembele. We've desperately missed him for the last couple of years because, first of all, he had those injuries and then he left. Um, so I think that could add another, a certain sort of, uh, I, I can't think of the word, but strength and power, I suppose, in our midfield now that we don't have Moussa Dembele in there anymore. Uh, Tottenham Reese asking, how do you feel about Wolves being interested in Sammy Kadira? Um, again, that's not one I've heard of. But Wolves, their their transfer strategy at the moment is absolutely perfect. And those players that they're bringing in, uh, I know Nuno Espirito Santo is a manager who's been uh, attracting a lot of interest. And personally, if Pochettino were to leave Tottenham in the near future, Nuno Espirito Santo is 100% the man who'd like to take over. Um, but the signings that Wolves are making this summer, I mean, to come up from the championship and spend, I think, only about 50 or 60 million net spend and then push on to finish seventh is an unbelievable achievement. And now they've signed Leander Dendonker and Rahul Jimenez, the two players they had on loan last season. But it was crucial for them that they got that over the line. Jimenez was their top scorer and um, Dendonker was a really good addition in the middle of the field uh, on loan, but now they've made that permanent. They've also signed Jesus Vallejo from Real Madrid. He's a centre-back who, again, he's kind of like Danny Ceballos. He's really close to making to breaking into that Real Madrid first team, but at the moment he's not there and he wants to go and better his... Uh, better himself really as a player, get a bit more game time and then hope to make it into the Real Madrid team. So that's signing of Vallejo and they already have the likes of Conor Cody and Willie Bali back there. They're strengthening this team so much and at the moment, if there's any team that I think will be breaking into the top six anytime soon, Wolves are 100% the biggest team, the bit, the best shout for that if a team is going to do it. Um, they're also close to signing uh, AC Milan striker Patrick Catrone who's again a highly rated young player. Um, so if they can add Sammy Kadira to that as well, I think... We don't have to look out for him, but I think the likes of Arsenal, Chelsea and United, if they don't, if they have similar seasons to last year, I think they'll be looking over their shoulders at Wolves in the upcoming season. Um, 13th Monkey and Tottenham Reese both saying Wolves and Leicester uh, looking great, and Reese mentioning West Ham there as well. Um, Wolves and Leicester, outside the top six, without a shadow of a doubt, the two best teams in the league. I think Everton and West Ham, at the moment, looking at the squads, aren't too far behind them, but Wolves and Leicester, definitely the two best there. Um, and 13th Monkey here saying not West Ham, and... I think with West Ham, their transfer strategy outside the top six is probably the best in the league. Um, the, the players that they've signed over the last couple of years, like look at Marco Arnautovic, uh, Manuel Lanzini, Javier Hernandez, Andre Yarmolenko, and now this summer they've signed Pablo Fornals and Sebastian Haller. Um, the players that they are signing are absolutely immense. And those players in any other team would every season without a shadow of a doubt be fighting for a European position. But whatever it is with West Ham, they just don't seem to be able to make those signings worth it. Like, look at that signing of Sebastian Haller. They signed him for £45 million, and essentially he's a replacement for uh, Marco Arnautovic, a much better player. And last season, Haller was playing with Eintracht Frankfurt, and he was alongside Luka Jovic. Now, Luka Jovic has gone on and moved to Real Madrid um, for, I think, a similar transfer fee. But Haller had more goals and more assists than Luka Jovic last season. I know there's a difference there in age, but somehow, I don't know what it is, but the players that West Ham attract are so good and offer so much and promise so much, but they never seem to live up to the expectation. So I think in terms of squad, they're probably one of the best outside the top six, but it never amounts to anything. So I don't think we can speak about them as a team who will be challenging uh, for European football uh, anytime soon, to be honest. Um, Del Boy saying, if Everton signed Kane, they've, it's Moise Kane from uh, Juventus, they finally got a striker they've missed since Lukaku will upgrade them. Definitely, that's signing for Everton. Um, they're in talks to sign Moise Kane from Juventus. He's uh, like a 19-year-old striker who, believe it or not, was actually ahead of Dybala in the pecking order last season. Um, it's about £36 million that they're paying for him, but they're, crucially, there's a buyback clause in that contract. So uh, Juventus, there'll be a certain uh, transfer fee or whatever put in there that Juventus can buy him back whenever they want. Um, which for Everton, I suppose, because they need a striker so bad, maybe it could be worth it for them. But... Um, I don't know, that's definitely not a good thing to have in the contract. And Everton, with the signings they're making, obviously already have a really good uh, attack in there with the likes of uh, Richarlison and Gilfie Sigurdsson. 
Um, I'm surprised they sold Adam Ola Luckman, but now it looks like they're going to be getting Wilfred Zaha and Moise Kane. I think this is similar to Arsenal in that they're investing too heavily in that area of the pitch. For me, Everton would have to invest more in their midfield. Um, they've never had the strongest midfield in there, but the last couple of years they have been doing quite well. They've had the likes of Morgan Schneiderlin and Idrissa Ganagay, who's now going to PSG. So I think they're going to struggle similarly uh, in that position. They're investing too much uh, in the attack and should probably buy um, a few more midfielders. But look, um, I'm sure they know better than me, I suppose, what's going to be going on there and what they need to do. But uh, that's just my opinion. Um, now, uh, Del Boy saying, oh, sorry, no, Kyle saying, hope Maguire stays at Leicester. It will ruin national team if he goes for United. Um, I, I suppose that could be the case. I mean, going to United, he won't... It just seems to be with the players United sign, they don't have as much uh, form and they don't seem to do as well um, as they do with the other teams. So it could affect the national team a lot. But I think Maguire is a great player and um, he's he's going to be a good addition to United. I don't think he'll ever uh, be a bad player to have in the national team. Jimmy Page saying this, talks about a trade for Lukaku for Dybala. Hope that's not going to happen. It, it doesn't look like it will because um, uh, Dybala does want to stay at, at Juventus for the upcoming season. That was something that kind of knocked our hopes for signing uh, Dybala. But when Juventus said they were, or Sky Sports said Juventus were uh, preparing an offer to United for Romelu Lukaku that would be Dybala plus cash. Um, now apparently Dybala, if he was going to leave Juventus, would prefer a move to Tottenham over Manchester United. I assume mainly because of the Champions League attraction. But uh, I don't think that's going to happen. It does seem at the moment like Dybala will be uh, a Juventus player at the start of next season. Um... Let's try and get some more questions in here or comments in here in the the chat. Del by saying Lukaku will go to Inter. Um, it he could go, and at the moment it looks like he will probably go there. There's uh, someone made a great point in the live stream yesterday that for Lukaku at the moment he's second choice at United behind Rashford. If he goes to Juventus, he'd be second choice behind Ronaldo. But uh, at Inter, he'd be the main striker, and Antonio Conte has made that very clear. So even if uh, Dybala was open to move away from uh, Juventus, I think. The, the United deal, the Lukaku deal mightn't be very appealing to him mainly because he's going to United but also might be appealing to Lukaku because uh, he might be more inclined to go to Inter Milan I know Juventus are a better team who obviously win more and just do better than Inter Milan but for Lukaku, Inter might be a more appealing target um, Now there's uh, some other rumours about Tottenham uh, in the last few days, one of them was David Neres from uh, he plays at Ajax at the moment, you might remember him playing it against us in the in the Champions League, he played in the first leg in the semi-final, but he got injured in the warm-up, so missed the second leg. Um, oh, apparently, we're finding Everton for his signature. Uh, a fee worth around four million pounds is apparently what Ajax are looking for. Um, I, I don't think that's going to happen. It's not something that's been spoken about a lot. I don't think it's a realistic transfer target, and I think it's interesting that players like him and Danny Van de Beek, another player who we were linked with, are still at Ajax. But personally, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think he's going to go to Everton either because of the money they're investing. But as I said now a few times, I think the main players for us at the moment are Giovanni Lo Celso and Ryan Sessegnon. I do think they will happen this summer. I do think we're gonna, we're definitely going to add them to our squad and we're going to have a, a, a strong squad going into the upcoming season. Now what I'm expecting from the season ahead um, is top four and a, a good push, a, a realistic, strong push for a domestic cup. And I think what that would take is... Um, emphasizing the domestic cups putting strong squads out and that like rotation is important in those competitions i think getting the likes of troy Parrott, tanganga and maybe some harvey white uh jack rolls elliot thorpe a few of those players into that into that setup as much as possible they've all, all, most of them have just signed their first professional contract so i think it's important to get those players in but i think we need to balance it really well like we know pochettino can do and put strong enough teams out in the domestic cup and go on and win one of them because we need trophies but we, we, don't, we don't need trophies, but obviously it's a goal. It's the main goal to go on and win a trophy. So I think this season for us, a Champions League, uh, a bit of a campaign there. I'm not expecting another final. Um, but for me, I think our aim and a realistic expectation for this season is top four in domestic cup. So uh, put in the live chat there what you want to see from the season ahead in terms of uh, what we want in the league and in all the cup competitions. Um for me, in the league, I don't think it's realistic that we'll be challenging the likes of Liverpool or Manchester City, but I think we are ahead of United, Chelsea and Arsenal so that we can have we can solidify our place in that top four. Um, not easily, but with a relative bit of uh, sort of confidence that we will do that and then push on in the domestic cup. Um, 
ideally the FA Cup, but I mean I wouldn't be I wouldn't especially be sad if we uh, if we won the Carabao Cup. I mean a trophy is a trophy. Um, Tottenham Reese saying thinking about it, you could never write City uh, out of winning every domestic cup, and I suppose that is true. Of course, they did the domestic treble last season, but that sort of uh, monopoly on the competitions, the trophies like that, uh, it's never going to happen in English football. So I think we can confidently say that we will uh, have a great ch- a great chance at winning the domestic cups this season. Um, I think for Manchester City, because they've won everything there is to win in England, the the kind of crown jewels for them at the moment is that Champions League trophy, both for them as a club and for, for Pep Guardiola as a manager. So I think we might have a great, show, a great chance in the domestic cups this season because I think City would put so much emphasis on retaining that Premier League title but also going on and winning their first Champions League so I think we can't rule them out of the domestic cups but I don't think that would be their main priority this season um, Del Boy saying if we win the Carabao Cup people will still say we haven't won anything um, I suppose they will and I mean they have with that, that one we won in 2008 but um, at the end of the day it is a trophy and I mean we should aim to win it we should aim to win as many trophies as possible but those domestic cups at the moment are the most realistic and if we win the Carabao Cup sure people are going to say that but I mean we, we want trophies we want to fill up that trophy cabinet and it's a trophy. I mean, we have to take what we can get. So, um, thirteenth monkey saying today is to do European and league double. Um, probably not. <laughs> I'll be honest, probably not. But I, I don't think we're too far away from that. In if Pochettino stays at the club, because if he gets those signings in, and we're so close to that level where we will sign guys like Dybala. So I think in the next five ten years, if Pochettino is still there, it's only a matter of time before we do make that that massive jump, and we do have a season like that. Um, Tottenham Reese saying it was annoying I was out with my mates yesterday and I said United was bad as a joke then they made fun of me for hours saying Tottenham are bad and we haven't won anything they're United fans um, and that seems to be the go-to thing with Tottenham empty trophy cabinet and I think it's a, a very I want to say uneducated in, in terms of the football side of things it's a very uneducated way to look at the team because as Tottenham fans five years ago when uh, when Tim Sherwood uh, was told his contract was going to be uh, was going to be terminated at the end of the season. Um, there were a few of us uh, who there was a lot of uh, different opinions about that, but there were some of us who were a bit disappointed because he hadn't been given much chance, and he certainly hadn't been given the team that he that he wanted to make, and he hadn't been able to make any additions. And he was someone who, having been in the setup at the club, we kind of felt like he might have the inside knowledge to push us on further. And then he was let go, and we brought in this manager, this guy in, who was managing Southampton, who had never even spoken English in an interview. Um, and sure he brought them to their best ever finish but we, we didn't know who he was we didn't know what he offered to the team um, so he came in then and we had that say that first game against West Ham looking at some of the players that started out there if someone had told us in five years time we'd be uh, one of the best teams in England we'd have Champions League for the last four years we'd have uh, a Champions League final defeat just behind us obviously we prefer to win it but we a Champions League finalist in the last couple of years, we've beaten the likes of Real Madrid. We've beaten, uh, we've come close to knocking Juventus out. We've beaten Borussia Dortmund a number of times. Um, we've gone to the new camp and picked up a point in the Champions League. Um, anyone would have bitten our, your hand off for that as a Tottenham fan from the position that we were in. It looked like we were falling. It looked like we had maxed out at a Europa League team who will lose four or five nil to Liverpool and City, Arsenal and Chelsea every time we play them, and then we'd have those, those disappointing results against mid-table teams because that's essentially what we were turning into. We were just a team who we're just there I mean we were floating in around that top four but we never made it into it by those one or two seasons so while we haven't won any trophies the progression and the advancement that has gone on in Tottenham in the last five years there, there's no team out there at the moment who, who can match that with the way Tottenham have done it like sure City have made that uh, break into the top four but it's sheer financial investment that has done that for them and like you look at the teams who say throughout the Premier League era maybe since 2000 who have been in and around that top four you look at the likes of Newcastle uh, I think they were in the top four once and they finished fifth, sixth a number of times. Um, they even go back into the 90s, you can say Leeds were there for a bit. Uh, Everton had one break in the top four, but they've fallen away. The only team who have actually managed to breach that uh, sort of traditional top four of uh, United, Liverpool, Chelsea and Arsenal, there's Man City, who, as I said, have made that unbelievable investment. But Tottenham are the only team who have actually managed to do that the right way. I'm sure Leicester had one year in there, but that was a fluke year and they're kind of coming, up, kind of coming back towards that again. But Tottenham, what we have done and the way we have done it has, isn't something that has been matched and in recent times, to be honest, in terms of the consistency of when we're doing it. And 
personally to those people who say look Tottenham haven't won a trophy they're not a good team like there, there's nothing you can say back to them because obviously by saying that they've shown they don't know enough about football to have a, a legitimate discussion about it um, but the only thing we can really think is look we know how good Tottenham are we know where Tottenham are going we know that the the that potential is there to go on and do so well in the upcoming years um, I mean that's that's all we can really do in that sort of situation but as long as we know and we're confident in what Tottenham are and where we're going I mean that should be enough uh, Julio, Julio here saying at least we're better than Arsenal I suppose that is true although they don't seem to agree with that um, Del Boy saying Danny Rose would not go to Juventus at all the guy's previously been affected by racism in, in football and Italy is the worst place to go in that regard and that's actually a, a very very good point and not something I'd, I'd thought of myself um, so maybe that could be a factor in Danny Rose not joining Real Madrid or Juventus of course Moise Kane who's now leaving Juventus to go to Everton he had a lot of experience with uh, racism over the last season there's one incident I think they were playing Cagliari and uh, he was Moise Kane was uh, I think he scored a goal or something he was celebrating and there was uh, an insane amount of uh, racial abuse coming from the stands and even the, the team they were playing their captain came over and started you know trying to calm the fans down get them to stop and they started throwing things at him their own captain for defending this uh, this player who's been racially abused and after that game the Juventus manager and the captain Massimiliano Allegri and Leonardo, De, Leonardo Bonucci they both said uh, Kane played as much a part in it as the fans did so the the sort of the environment over there for uh, players who have suffered racial abuse and stuff like that is not good, and that's a great point that maybe that could be something that stops Rose from going to Juventus. Thirteenth uh, monkey saying we have to stop this defeatist attitude. We can win the league and or CL. We were ninety minutes away from being Champions League winners, and Jimmy Page agreeing with that, and that's a great point, and it's something I've kind of touched on over the last week with these live streams, with like. I kind of first said it with these links with Dybala. We have to stop thinking in the, the mindset that we are Tottenham. Because, as I said, that's something that other fans use against us. Tottenham traditionally are seen, as we know from those comments Sir Alex Ferguson uh, so famously made in the dressing room a number of times, lads, it's only Tottenham. That's certainly, that's without a shadow of a doubt, not the case anymore. And we need to stop thinking we're Tottenham and we need to start thinking we have one of the best managers in the world. We have one of the most exciting uh, teams going forward in the world. We have the best, one of the best stadiums, one of the best training facilities. And we have to realise we're a much more attractive team now than what we've ever been before. And it's just, it feels like we're so, so close to being in that team that attracts the likes of Paolo Dybala. And I think signing in Dambale is a big statement and a big step towards that. But we need to stop that defeatist attitude. We need to stop thinking we're Tottenham, it's not going to happen, they're not going to come to us. And start realising what is actually going on in the club, the project that is there, and where we're going as a team. And at the moment it's looking like that's only on the up. Um, so we do certainly have to realise that we have to take more of a look at what's happening now rather than what's happened in the past and uh, Julio saying you can't name a better glow up than Tottenham and that's as I said a minute ago there's no team that can match what we have done and that is definitely true Bradley saying I think Levy needs to spend more money if we don't win a trophy or at least compete for the league Potts will leave next season I don't know if Potts will leave next season because I think they, f they share that mindset that, that they're only going to invest in the squad if they can identify a player that will improve that squad but as, as again as Levy said himself the only place left for Tottenham the only place left for us to go the only thing left for us to do is invest heavily in that squad um, again I'm going to reiterate not in the way that Man United do it but in a way that every player we bring in adds something and whether it's uh, first team quality or whether it's uh, a player who can be used in rotation or adding squad depth whatever it is we're so close to that the money needs to be put in to get players like Lacelso, Dybala and stuff like that so we can push on and win trophies Um and as 13th Monkey said a minute ago, we were only 19, 19 minutes away from being the champions of Europe. And when you put it like that, it's it's an insane thing to think about. And it also kind of adds to that feeling, that that disappointment that we were so close to doing it. Um, Tottenham Reese saying, Man City's team is ageing now, average age of 28, so they will have to retire soon. Um, yeah, I suppose that is true, but with, with the way City are going, they don't, they don't depend on the team they have now. They're not going to have that in three years, they're not going to have it in four years. What they seem to do is get players in just before their prime age, maybe 25, 26, have them for the three or four years through their prime, and then, you know, with the likes of David Silva, who's still a quality player, to have him in and around when he's needed and stuff like that. Um, 13th Monkey saying, we'll be up there with Liverpool and City this season, just need a few more fresh faces. Um, and as I said, we're so close to them. With the what we're kind of expecting from the window this, this season, I don't think we'll be challenging with them next season. But we are so close, and we're just, we seem like we're one step away from that that final step to what Pochettino was trying to achieve at the club 
Del Boy saying, if we want to push for a title, we need to improve away to the top six. Uh, terrible record last season. We all seem too shy away and not rise to the occasion at the Emirates, at the Emirates and Anfield. Um, of course, our record against the top six is something that has been uh, publicised a lot in terms of we, we don't win those big games. And the away form is the, the main part of that. Just going through, we're thinking now the games we played away last season. We beat Man United 3-0. Um, we lost 2-0 to Chelsea. We lost uh, 4-2 to Arsenal. We lost 2-1 to Liverpool and we lost 1-0 to Man City. So, I mean, three points out of a potential 15 in that just proves your point. Um, certainly that's a position we do, uh, an area we do need to improve on. There has been a bit of advancement in that uh, in that regard. I mean, going over, say, the last three or four seasons, we've won at Old Trafford, of course, this season. We've picked up a few points at, at Anfield. We've beaten City a few times. We've beaten Chelsea, of course, for the first time in 28 years. So... Again, it does seem like we're making progression in that area, but you're 100% right in saying that's, that's in terms of uh, performances and results, that's the one area where we need to improve. We seem to have gotten rid of that, um, you know, dropping silly points against the lower teams. And I know towards the end of last season, it was something that we did, but it seems to be something that everyone was doing, apart from, of course, Liverpool and City. Um, now, Carlos saying, what's happening with Marcus Edwards? He had a decent loan spell in Holland last season. Um, he seems to be a player that there was just too much hype around and he struggled to live up to the expectation uh, that's something Pochettino has spoken about as well. He regrets calling him the, the mini Messi. Um, it looks like Marcus Edwards, he's not going to really make it at Tottenham. And personally, I think it's only a matter of time before he leaves the club. Um, Dennis Lee asking thoughts on Danny Alves to Spurs. Just curious. Um, I don't think that's something that's going to happen. As regular Joe says, Danny Alves' wage is way too high. Um, he's the most successful player in club history. And he, even though he is 36, he still offers a lot to a team. And he did well at PSG last year. But I, I don't think it's something that's realistic. I don't think it's something that will happen. Having said that, though, if it did, I think he'd be a great addition to the squad. Um, he's someone who sees his career going on in another couple of years uh, to bring Brazil to the next World Cup. But I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, Bradley saying, Matt, if all the squads remain how they are now, what is your predicted top four? Um, I suppose now I suppose that uh, means we're not going to sign the Celso and Sessegnon. Um, if that does happen, I would say... I still think City are going to win the league again. I think they just have that bit more than Liverpool, as I said, mainly in that midfield. I think Manchester City, I think City have that, the title. Um, I suppose Liverpool second because uh, there's no team really at their level right now to compete there. Um, in third, I, I would have to say Tottenham because we were only one point behind Chelsea last year and obviously they're not, they can't make any additions to their squad. But because now we brought in Ndombele and we've strengthened that midfield, even with one signing, it strengthened so much. Um, I'd have to say I think we would be in third um, fourth it's it's so hard to say between Chelsea United and Arsenal because they're all they're all in a similar position where they're they're trying to rebuild they're trying to they're trying to go back to the glory days basically but they're so inconsistent and with these signings they make it's, it's hard to say with the signings they've already made apart from Chelsea obviously it's hard to say how they're going to do it's hard to say what w what will be but if I absolutely had to pick I would say United will nip fourth this season, Chelsea in fifth, Arsenal in sixth, and then the likes of Wolves and Leicester not too far behind. Um, uh, Julio saying, you think now that we're in the new stadium for good, that we really push for the Premier League? Um, I hope so. I mean, there was a comment yesterday on my live stream that um, we need to make the Tottenham Stadium a fortress, and if we do, there's no reason why we can't go on and win stuff. And with that last season at White Hart Lane, when we won 17 out of our 19 games, when we drew two, we're unbeaten there all season in all competitions. I think, fun, funnily enough, the only team that actually came close to beating us that season was Wickham in the FA Cup when he did two at the time goals to beat them. But if we had been in White Hart Lane for another season or two and maybe held on to Kyle Walker, I think we would have our first league title by now. And this is something that was spoken about a lot when we did make that move to Wembley because of our bad record there. We we were so close to doing that at White Hart Lane. We'd made it such a fortress. We were, so, we were just a, a terrifying prospect to play at White Hart Lane that... If we had been there for another season or two, potentially we could have gone on and won the league. Because making that move to Wembley obviously affected our form so much. I mean, the first few games we played there, we drew with Burnley, we drew with Swansea, we lost, obviously lost to Chelsea. I think it was October before we beat Burnley there, or before we beat Bournemouth there in our first victory. So I think having that, the fact that we are back home is going to be a massive boost to the team. And um, When we went there for the first time last season, we had those victories against Crystal Palace, uh, we beat Man City. Um, there's another couple of victories in there Brighton as well it was a big one so you could see the boost it had in the squad when we did go back there last season so I think being back in the new stadium is going to be um, play a massive part in where we go in the next couple of seasons but I'll come back to it signings are the most important and adding a lot of depth to that squad 
Um, Joe27 asking any more news on, news on Lo Celso. Um, there doesn't seem to be at the moment. It, it just seems to be, as it has been for the last week or two, he could sign at any moment. Um, the, the latest news regarding how much we're going to pay for him is about £50 million. Uh, there's a clause in his contract that is forcing Real Betis to drop their price that if they reject an offer worth more than double what they signed him for, um, they'd have to increase his, his wages and they don't seem to be in a financial position to do that now having signed someone like Nabil Fekir and having missed out on European football. Um, now they signed him from PSG in April for about £21.7 million. So I suppose taking into account any potential add-ons in that deal an offer about £45-£50 million could be what it takes to bring him to Tottenham. Um, there's I know there's some people saying earlier in this stream, according to his Instagram story, he is in the United Kingdom, he was in Cardiff, and some people saying he was in London. I'm not sure how true that is, but I do feel like it's a deal that will that will be done. It's only a matter of time with that one. Um, Del Boy saying, not Chelsea, I think Arsenal 5th, Chelsea 6th, Lampard a new coach with young, inexperienced players. On top of that, losing their one-man team, Hazard, and they can't replace him. Um, I suppose it's not that they can't replace him. It's really important to remember they signed Christian Pulisic in January and loaned him back to Borussia Dortmund. So th that is a new player that's coming into their team this season. Um, and they've also brought in Mateo Kovacic on a permanent deal. So while there is that transfer in Vargo, they have brought those few players in. And then you have to look at the players that are coming back on loan, like Mason Mount, who was a pivotal part to Lampard's season at Derby last year. And also the the centre-back, um, I can't think of his name at the moment, but uh, there's a centre-back there that's going back to Chelsea as well. Um, so I, I don't know, it's it's hard to, to guess, I suppose, how well, has, how well Lampard is going to do at Chelsea this season. Because obviously he hasn't managed in the Premier League yet. And while he did have a decent spell at at Derby before he came into Derby their last few uh, seasons had kind of averaged out at a sixth place finish and they lost in the playoffs the majority of the time uh, so and that's all he did with them he got them sixth and he lost in the playoff final so while you can say he did a decent enough job at, at Derby because the championship is such an unpredictable league it's such a hard league to do well in I think you do have to give him credit where it's due there but he didn't advance the club in any way and coming into Chelsea now as you say not being able to make those signings um, I do think he'll struggle but you, you, you can't rule him out yet because you don't know what Lampard is as a manager you don't know what he can do and he's going to have a lot of he's going to have the relationships within, within the club and he's going to have those players on his side straight away because he's a Chelsea legend I mean he's their highest scorer of all time he's won so many trophies with them you have to kind of take into account that factor but um, as you said I don't think they're going to be uh, up there this season and I don't think they're going to win anything but I do think you, you can't underestimate for the season ahead um Regular Joe saying a decent season in Holland doesn't translate to Premier League ready. He couldn't even cut it in the Championship. His career was doomed the minute he was labelled Mini Messi. And that's in reference now to Marcus Edwards. And as you said, a decent season in Holland doesn't mean anything for the Premier League. And you only have to look at Vincent Janssen to realise that. I mean, when we signed him, he'd just been the top scorer in the Eredivisie. And, I mean, we've just sold him out to Monterey for about £6 million. Um, you, can never, you can never rely too much on form in another league to sort of predict how well a player is going to do in, in 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 the Premier League and I think it's over for Marcus Edwards as you say his career was doomed the minute he was labelled mini Messi and that's something Pochettino has openly said he desperately regrets and he shouldn't have done and it's a bit unfortunate because Marcus Edwards was such an exciting prospect but it was in the end that was his downfall because there was so much expectation there was so much uh, hope and potential there that he just couldn't live up to it and as you say he couldn't even cut it in the championship um, it seems to be the end for him um, Tottenham Reese saying Norris will get top 10 mark my words um, do you know what it's, it's not impossible I mean the those teams at the bottom half of the Premier League you never know what to expect from them there's so many teams just differing in form like you see look at Burnley two seasons ago they got Europa League football and last season they just about escaped relegation and I mean all those teams in there are so inconsistent season on season anything is possible and Norwich what they what they did last season with when Daniel Farke came in they built a team that it had a lot of championship experience so it it did really well going forward but it's also a team that isn't just for the championship it's a team that can do well in a number of different leagues and the way they're not making many signings this summer and I think Farrakhan said they're not going to make any more it's a team that's the same as what they had in the in the championship and while you can't say they're going to finish top 10 or they're going to struggle or in any way you can't predict what's going to happen because I mean just look at uh, what happened last year with the likes of Fulham and uh, and Wolves I mean Fulham were one of the most exciting teams coming up and they made those heavy investments and you felt like they were going to be safe and they finished uh, what 18 points at the end of the season and then Wolves uh, finishing up in 7 so it's, it's so hard to predict what those teams coming up are going to do 
and Del Boy saying, I have to say, I think Norwich may struggle. Teams like Fulham who come up and try to play pretty football like Norwich often get battered because the top teams are just better at that game. And that's a great point. I mean, I suppose that could have been ultimately the downfall for Fulham, the way they tried to play that attractive football. And while it's what worked for them uh, in the second half of their championship season when they made that massive push to the playoffs uh, in the Premier League, that's, that's just not going to cut it because every other team is so much better than them at it. Um, and Tottenham Reefs, just saying now, uh, Norwich signed Ralph Fairman, um, which for them is a, a massive signing. Um, he, he's a player who played with Schalke in the Bundesliga. He's a goalkeeper. Um, now, Norwich's main keeper last season in the championship was Tim Krul, who I'm sure we all remember did really well for a number of years at Newcastle. So adding to that, they have two great keepers in there, uh, both of whom can, can do well for them. And Fairman is a massive signing, and it's one that really, really confused me because Fairman is starting keeper in the Bundesliga. Now, it is only a loan deal that Norwich have signed him on, but it's still a, a big addition for them. And Dennis Lee saying, just subbed, been Spurs fan for three years. Thanks, Dennis. I, to everyone who has subscribed, by the way, I do really appreciate the support. Um, it's a bit mad to me. I started this channel two months ago and I'm already close to 1,000 subscribers. So uh, to, to everyone who has subscribed to the channel, I do I do really appreciate it and thanks so much for the support. Um, Del Boy saying, Tim Krul is really good. Remember that game against us? You know what? I've tried to forget that game against us, but I just can't. Um, record saves or something. This is a game that we played at White Hart Lane. Uh, we were playing Newcastle. I think it was, it was one of those games that we have every couple of seasons where we're close to the top of the table and we always just mess it up when it gets good. And we played Newcastle at White Hart Lane and they scored an early goal. I think it was a Papa Cisse maybe who scored it? or No, it was Lark Remy, I remember, who scored that goal. I rounded Brad Friedel in the goal and tapped it in. And for the rest of the game, we absolutely dominated. There were so many chances, so many moments where we thought that was the goal. And Tim Krul actually made 14 saves in that game, which was a Premier League record at the time. I think that has been beaten now. David De Gea against Arsenal uh, last season beat that record. But um, at the time, it was a record. And uh, it's a game that... It's it's but like watching things like Premier League years. It's one of the games I look out for to try and avoid because it was just such a frustrating game to watch, and it's one of those you never really forget about. Um, Tottenham Reese saying everyone share this stream. Try get Matt to one k subs by Wednesday. Thanks Reese for that. Um, and if you do if you do enjoy this content uh, that I do with these fa these live streams and the transfer talk and stuff like that, I would appreciate if you could share out my channel um, to people who might also be interested. In, mainly obviously of course Tottenham fans. Um, I'm trying to get to a thousand subs as soon as possible so I can give away a free jersey. Um, it's going to be a Tottenham home jersey for the upcoming season with a name and number. Um, when I get when I get a thousand subscribers, I'm going to put out a video and let you know how you can win that. I haven't quite decided yet what I'm going to do, but uh, I'll let you know as soon as I get to a thousand subscribers. Um, at the moment, I think I'm on 918 now with with Dennis subscribed. I'll, I'll check in a second. But um, yeah, if you do enjoy this content, I'd appreciate it if you could help me out in uh, growing this channel. Um, now. Del Boy saying De Gea against us last year, he was terrible against everyone else but us at Wembley. And that, that seems to be the case with us so often. Like, David De Gea had such a poor end to last season, then we played him at Wembley. Um, I think it was kind of before, just before his poor form started, but he made so many good saves, and of course then Rashford scored the goal that beat us. And it's not just him, it seems to be so often that we just get that unlucky side of things where these teams who are on bad form or players who are injured just come back to play against us, and it's... I think it's gone too far for it to be seen as a coincidence at this stage, to be honest. It seems to always happen to us. And more often than not, we do come through it, but it happens so much that we're just that unfortunate team who who gets the a team on, the, on their day and stuff like that. Um, Del Boy saying, Leno at Wembley, again, yeah, he made that, mainly that double save that stopped us from going 2-1 up, and Arsenal went on to uh, nearly win it, but Lloris saved us in the end. But it's it's something I suppose that we're just getting used to at this stage. Um, if any more questions about transfers in the season ahead, put them in there to the live chat and I'll answer them as much as I can. I just want to remind you about a Facebook group I'm running. After I publish the video, I will put a link to that in the description. And also a fantasy football league I'm doing. The code is 8MTEKC. Uh, that's just for Tottenham fans. If you do want to share it out to your uh, Tottenham friends and family, um, we'll try and get as many people we can in that league and have it a good, exciting one for the for the season ahead. Um Regular Joe saying, agree, Delvoy, easily the best performance of any keeper last season. I assume that's Leno at Wembley. Um, Thomas asking, why is it that Lacelso transfer has gone so quiet? Um, I think maybe from what we've heard about the Paolo Dybala thing, Tottenham might have been prioritising that deal and hoping to get the Dybala one over the line and maybe fall back on Lacelso. And I imagine that will be happening now. Um, but also, you have to remember there are, uh, with, with any deal, there are these nitty gritty details that have to be done, like the small little clauses in the contract and the. Uh, the personal terms and the things with the agent and then actually getting him a working visa and uh, getting the papers done with the Premier League. There's so much that has to be done. Um, but 
and that's just with any transfer but then you have to think about the way Daniel Levy negotiates so he's gonna he's gonna do so so much with those little tiny uh, details and that is why these transfers do take longer and it, it is a bit annoying but um, I think it's just those negotiations I imagine they're coming to an end now um, it won't be long before we see the Celso holding up the jersey but um, I would say that is why those uh, that news has gone quiet in the last uh, couple of weeks and I'd say it's the same with uh, Sessegnon as well um, there's no one really that we're uh, kind of aiming for it to get instead of him um, and it does look like at the moment Fulham are hoping to still hold on to him but with one year left in his contract if he does hold out to um, to not sign that contract I do think eventually Fulham will have to let go so it could be Fulham holding up that side of things but also it could be George Kevin and Kudu um, this is uh, Tottenham in the know on, a, on Blogspot um, he's one I only heard of in the last couple of days but looking back through his stuff he seems to be very accurate w with what he said and uh, he's saying now that it is uh, Nkudu who's holding up that deal he doesn't want to go to Fulham um, the Anima side of things is done um, and Cessna wants to go to Tottenham Fulham are willing to let him go for the 20 million and those two players but at the moment it does seem like it's Nkudu who's holding up that um, so I'm sure there's a number of different factors as to why those uh, those news things have gone quiet but I'd say they might be the main ones uh, Carlos saying what's your favourite player song and sing it <laughs> I won't be singing it, um, but I, I like the new one, the Indombele one of the, the the tune of the Lion King song instead of a Wimbo Ace Indombele. I won't sing it, but uh, at the moment that's probably my favourite one because the new, new signing and all that. Um, 13th Monkey saying, trouble is PSG get 20% of any Lacelso deal, and that is true, that's something that will uh, kind of incentivise Betis to push that price up as much as they can. There's a sell-on clause in the contract they sign, they sign to get Lacelso from uh, PSG. And also there's 3% of that has to go to Rosario Central, who uh, is the first team that uh, La Celso played with. So for Betis, they're not going to get as much money as it will appear from that deal. So they will try and push the price up as much as possible. But, but as I said, that clause in La Celso's contract, that if they reject a bid for more than 45 million, they'll have to increase his wage. That will also play a factor. But in these uh, contracts like this, there's going to be so many um, different factors that will bump up the price or bring the price down. And it's just the two teams trying to find that middle ground, essentially. Um, Jimmy Page saying, is Bale still off to China? One million per week seems hard to turn down, or was that just rumours? Um, that wasn't rumours, that was uh, completely true. Bale has, Bale's representatives have been in talk with the Chinese Super League team, Jiangsu Suning, uh, over the last couple of days. But uh, according to Sky Sports and Football London, Football this morning, that deal has fallen through and Bale will not be joining uh, Jiangsu Suning. Um, it was a million pounds a week that he's been offered, and... Um, I, I don't think Bale would have turned that down. I don't think that's where the thing has fallen through. Fallen through. I don't know what it is, of course, but um, I it, it it has fallen through basically. Um, at the moment, according to Marca, the Spanish outlet, he is going to be staying at Real Madrid this season. But I I don't think he will be. I think it is only a matter of time before he moves. It's important now to remember that the Chinese window actually closes on Wednesday, so there's only three days to get that deal over the line. Um, so that might have played a factor in the in that falling through. Um, I just want to say as well, if you are enjoying this video and you are enjoying these live streams, please uh, drop a like on the button just below the video. Um, it really helps me out in terms of uh, getting my videos out there and stuff like that. So if you're ever enjoying any of these videos, please don't hesitate to like it. And as I said, share it uh, if you think it's something uh, that adds value to other people and stuff like that. Um, Bradley saying, do you think we will have the season like last season or even better? Um, I think uh, in the league, it might be a bit similar in terms of just getting into that top four and... Uh, just going from there I think it would be better on the domestic cup side of things I mean we're knocked out pretty early in the FA Cup by Palace and I know we made the semi-final of the Carabao Cup but that disappointing defeat and penalties to Chelsea um, so I think it will be similar but I'm, I'm not going to rule out a better season because as I said that domestic cup is something we need. I think we need to prioritise this season and I imagine Pochettino will be thinking fairly similarly to that as well um, Del Boy saying Lo Celso played CDM at PSG you know very versatile player um, and that as I said is something he offers he can play in that attacking role and he is very good there but he can also play in that holding role and he's really good as a box to box midfielder so I think his versatility and his diversity there in that play is something that will add a lot to the team just like in Dombele and you know, players like Ericsson and Ali they also have that uh, versatility so I think he's for that reason and a number of others someone that we need to get into the squad this summer Delboy saying last minute Levy offers Zidane 50 million across 50 years for Bale just to get him off his hands <laughs> Do you know what? It wouldn't surprise me with Levy. I mean, when he signed Sissoko, it was six million every year over five years. 
Um, that one may be a bit a bit uh, optimistic or a bit uh, out there. Um, but look, it, we can't really rule out um, Tottenham going in for a move for Bale because of the history that is there and the fact that Bale, it looks so uh, likely that he will leave Real Madrid this summer. Now, I, I, I'm going to look at that football at London article after this video and I leave a pinned comment or something about that. Um, someone commented a while ago saying that football that London believe Tottenham are going in for Bale now that the move to Jiangsu Suning has fallen through. Um, Jimmy Page has said, always drop a like on your vids before you even start watching, mate. Always quality content. Thanks for that, Jimmy. I, as I said, I do really appreciate that support. Um, now to see, getting a few more comments in here. Um, there's nothing coming through at the moment. Um, I want to talk a bit about, I know I already touched on it, but those uh, comments that Kieran Trippier made, um, he was asked about that move to Tottenham, and as I said, he said there was stuff going on behind the scenes that he, he said he didn't want to get into it, but that kind of uh, forced that deal through. Um, I The media has immediately called that and said, look, there's unrest in the dressing room, and I, I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think that's something Pochettino would stand for. And there's a few people saying this in the live stream yesterday as well. It's not something that Pochettino would stand for. And when you look at those those social media posts that we see so often from the likes of Deli Ali, Musa Sissoko, Serge Aurier, they, they seem to be such a close-knit group and unrest is without a doubt something I don't think is in that dressing room. And as there was a comment a while ago about uh, Trippier playing in the third place playoff in the World Cup last year while he was injured, uh, could have played a part in that. And also the situation we are in with right-backs at the moment, with the way the club were looking to sign a new one, Pochettino might have said that to Trippier and that might have, uh, that might have forced him, not forced him, but led, him, led to him leaving the club. Or he could have said, look, or your fourth Kyle Walker-Peters are ahead of you in the pecking order, or one or two of them. Um, and there's so many things that Trippier could have uh, meant by that. But I, I don't think it's unrest. And I think maybe it's a good sign that a player who was unhappy, uh, not unhappy, but there was things going on there that we didn't know about. Maybe it's a good sign that the club got him out as quickly as possible. And that's another thing that might suggest there is no unrest there. Because if there's a player who's, unha who's unhappy, who, who's a bit... He was not 100% uh, at the club. I think it might be best to get him out. And I know Ericsson is similar to that, but I think it's a different situation there. Um, that seemed to have all been resolved now, and the fact that he decided to go on that pre-season tour is, a, is really encouraging. But I think it's a good representation of the philosophy and the mentality and what's going on at the club, that with the slightest bit of, uh, I don't want to say unrest, but something going on behind the scenes, Trippier got out as quickly as possible. And I think that's something that we have to look at as a good thing. Um, Jimmy Page saying he looked great in that game against Madrid. Um, is that the one against Atletico Madrid? Oh, sorry, against Real Madrid. Yeah, sorry, plays with Atletico. Um, yeah, Atletico Madrid actually beat Real Madrid 7-3 in a friendly the other day. Um, it was a very strange one. And <laughs> when Gareth Bale was coming off the bench, I think they were 5-0 or 6-1 down. And there's all these, you know, they make a lot of subs in a, a pre-season game. There was four or five of them coming on and they were all looking serious. You see Bale in the back as he's waiting to come to the pitch laughing. And I think that kind of shows where he is with his place at Real Madrid at the moment. He he expected to leave maybe to Jiangsu Suning at that point or maybe there's another team that he's close to signing for um, George saying your content Matt is great lots of discussion of potential transfers explaining them keep up the great work thanks George I appreciate that comment um, Bradley saying don't think they should sell Rose he's been one of our consistent players this season um, I agree that's for, uh, from the minute we heard that Rose might be leaving even those comments he made after the Champions League I, I never wanted him to leave he's a player that I love and I know the majority of fans do love um, and he's a consistent player and he's most of all, he's a quality player and he is someone who fits really well into the way we play football. Um, I suppose because he's been part of that, uh, bringing that into the team. Um, so I, I hope he does stay at the club this summer. Um, I don't know if it would affect the Sessegnon deal, as someone said a while ago. But um, I'd love to see him stay at the club this summer, as I'm sure many of us do. Um, Delboy saying, would you agree that we better hope Poch can turn Foyth into a top right back for this season? I suppose at the moment that's looking like our best our best hope, even though I don't think it will happen for this season. Um, and we do know that Pochettino has spoken to Foyth uh, personally about uh, sort of moulding him into a right-back. Um, it's definitely what, what Pochettino sees is his future. Um, and Foyth, when he has played right-back, he's had some great performances, but he's also had some kind of dodgy ones. And even played in centre-back, he, he has shown that sort of inexperience that he does have. Like Remember that game against uh, Wolves? We were beating them 3-0 at, at Molyneux. And Foyth came on and gave away two penalties and nearly threw away the game. And also, I think there was one against West Ham where he wasn't that he wasn't that great. And then that game towards the end of the season against Bournemouth, where he came off the bench and got sent off after ninety seconds. He isn't um, he isn't I'd say a first team regular starter at the moment, but he is someone who I think uh, going forward could be a great uh, a great player in that position. 
Jimmy Page saying keep Rose 100% but possibly something going on behind the scenes that is pushing him to move on and I suppose that could be true that could be something similar to the Kieran Trippier one if Pochettino has made it clear he's looking to improve in the full back positions or something like that but the fact that he is still at the club and nothing has really materialised in any way at the moment I think he will be kept at the club this summer um, Alex Cowan saying hi Matt just subscribed great show as usual good work thanks a million Alex I, I appreciate the comments um, George saying where do you think the Trippier and Janssen money will be put into um, I think that will be kind of what we see going into the Sessegnon and the Celso deals because uh, obviously we were told uh, we needed to sell to sign and it's looked like those are the players we have gotten out now to um, to get into that team now while the the La Celso money and the Sessegnon money there are some people thinking it could come from the AIA deal or there could be a bit of money left over from the Champions League prize fund or uh, the new naming rights for the stadium there's apparently a deal has been struck not announced yet um, I think it will be the money from Trippier and Janssen that plays a big part in getting those signings done and while the La Celso and Sessegnon one were uh, they were something that we heard about beforehand I do think going on behind the scenes they would have known that deal was going to happen um, so I think that's where that money will go if that's not the case if La Celso and Sessegnon is different I think that money will be put into like I would have hoped for a right back but that's not something the club are, are going to do at the moment maybe a backup striker maybe another centre back there's a few positions where we could add a bit more depth um, but it definitely won't be invested in the midfield because that seems done for the season ahead once we get that Lacelso deal over the line uh, Del Boy saying Son and Foyt suspended for first two games Man City as well toughest game and yeah that's something that I don't, I don't think we really thought about when that happened against Bournemouth at the end of last season um, but they are suspended for the first two games Foyt's not as big a miss as Son is of course but um yeah, they're going to be Son is going to be a massive miss for those first two games. I think we'll we'll be fine against Aston Villa because especially if we get those signings over the line, it's going to be that a great feeling in the stadium and the squad with the fans going into that first game. I think it's going to be similar to when uh, when Mourinho. I don't know if his first or second season at United, but after they got that uh, Ibrahimovic deal, they got the Pogba deal, they got Lukaku deal. They made all these great signings, and there was a, a lot of positivity going into the season, and. They, they went out and beat West Ham 4-0 in their first game. They went to beat Bournemouth. I think there's another 4-0 in there somewhere. So I think there's going to be a similar sort of feeling around the club going into our first game against Villa. Um, having that, like so much positivity, it could uh, help us over the line in that one. Although it will be tough because Villa will have a similar sort of thing now. Because of course being promoted back to the Premier League when it felt like when they were relegated, it would be a while before we saw them again. Um, and with the investments they're making this summer, over 100 million spent already and it doesn't look like they're stopping anytime soon. Um, but into that City game if we do beat Villa maybe we can carry that for the positivity into the next game but um, it'll, it'll be tough uh, without a doubt without Son um, Bradley saying maybe Potch feels like he needs to get rid of some players to strengthen it I trust Potch in what he does but I don't know about Rose going um, and yeah that, that is definitely the case he does need to get rid of the players that are there because if we if we have if we kept the players that we had and we still brought in more players not only would that be diff difficult financially but it would also add like you want competition in your squad but you want to balance it that you don't have too many players in there as well because that will affect the mentality of those players who aren't getting into the team as much as they want and again just cause unrest in the dressing room there's unhappy players and all that so they, while we do want to add depth we do need to get rid of a few players in order to bring a few more in and it looks like that's what's going on now at the moment um, there's a comment here saying I think Ericsson is blocking players coming in um, I don't know about that I mean may maybe he is maybe Tottenham had planned on him leaving the club or they they'd expected him to leave and maybe that was going to fund more moves um, which I suppose something is now that you make the comment something we do have to kind of think of that like we would have got about 70 or 80 million for Ericsson so maybe that's the money that would have gone towards Dybala or a right back or a centre back or something like that so maybe that is something we do have to think about when we realise that we haven't had as good a window as we might have been expecting um, David Peter saying would you have traded this year's Champions League final appearance for a domestic trophy I personally wouldn't but seems like most people would that is a great question. <laughs> um, I wouldn't have done it for a Carabao Cup. Would I swap Champions League final for an FA Cup? Um, put put in the live chat what you guys think about it. I'm actually really interested in that. It's a really good question from David. Would you have traded this year's Champions League final for, uh, we say, an FA Cup uh, victory? Personally, I, I really don't know if I would because while it's obviously better to get those trophies in, getting to a Champions League final is something that obviously doesn't happen in Tottenham very often and it's 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 something that we're obviously going to remember forever because it's you know, our first Champions League final and it was such a big way to get there how we did it you know, making that comeback in the the Champions League some, or in the group stage then 
that great performance against Dortmund, then the comeback against City, and the last minute disallowed goal, then the comeback against Ajax. I, I don't know. Um, George here is saying FA Cup, it's a trophy. Uh, Jimmy Page saying that's a tough one. And Brandy saying nah, Champions League final all the way. So I suppose that's, that's all you need to see. One person saying FA Cup, one saying Champions League, and one saying they don't know. Um, that's a really tough one. But if I had to decide... Ooh, I might, I might just say Champions League final. Even though I would love a trophy, it's it's something that doesn't happen in teams very often. And, I mean, it's it was just such a good run. And that, that three weeks at the end of the season, the anticipation waiting for that to happen, even though obviously it didn't end very well. Um, Delboy here saying FA Cup. Um, and Jimmy Page saying, isn't there more money from Champions League final than winning the FA Cup? I take the final so we can build. That's a great point. I think we made about £67 million extra from making it to the Champions League final than we would have from just being in the... In the semi-final, so that is a great point. But yeah, I, th I think personally I would have taken the Champions League final, but it is a really, really tough one. Um, by Jay Spurs just joining the chat here. Um, there's a comment here. Ian Richardson saying, "Why do you take for granted that a Sky say Dybala staying? It is so." They said the day before that Juve would swap him for Lukaku, and the day before that we were the favourites to get him. Um, well, things change very quickly. You have to remember that. I mean, when we were the favourites to get him, there was nothing there. They didn't know about Juventus's uh, potential bid to sign him to sign Lukaku in. I would have swapped there. Like things change so quickly, especially this close to the end of the window. Teams are trying so desperately to get deals done. They can jump in for this. They can jump in for that. Things change so quickly, and personally, I would say Sky are the best source out there for anything to do with uh, English football, especially. And this guy in, in Italy that have said Dybala wants to stay, so I imagine they would have a better insight than the majority of sources. Um, I suppose I just trust Sky sources more than many other, more than the majority of outlets. Maybe football that London is one I'd. I uh, trust as well but um, because they just seem to get it so right so often I do I do trust what they say even though it doesn't always come through come true um, Alex saying as well Defo Champions League final gives us so much confidence proves we can do it um, Bradley saying do you think there will be more players coming in than Celso and Sessegnon um, I think there might be one more signing I don't know if it's a, someone that we'll have already heard of as a, as a transfer target or if it's going to be someone completely new um, I would hope that that is the case that we will sign someone extra but as I said if we for the last 10 days of the window if we get the Celso and Sessegnon done and we keep Alder Vyra and Eriksson and Rose I don't think we can ask for much more than that that for me would be uh, an A plus window and um, while getting another player in would be better I it's not something I'd be expecting of the club or I would ask of them if they do get that those five things done um, Darren saying when will we sign players um, it looks like it will be this week for the Celso and Sessegnon um, some reports saying it'll be done by Tuesday um, I, I know we have heard that I suppose for quite a while now but getting this close to the end of the window it does feel like these will be done soon and hopefully they will be in the team to play Inter Milan when we get back to London on the 4th of August uh, George saying Matt would you swap Ericsson for Dybala um, as I've said I, I, I think I probably would because Ericsson has one year left in his contract first of all it's something we really have to think about he hasn't signed that new contract yet and while he all, although he is expected to he hasn't signed it yet Dybala, he's younger, and I suppose he's more experienced, playing at a higher level. He's he's won more than Eriksson. Um, I think he's in the international setup. He has more, uh, not more to offer internationally, but he he plays in a better international team, and I, I just think he's a better player than Eriksson. So at the moment, a straight swap for the two of them, I would say yes. I'm not sure how I'd feel, though, if Eriksson did sign that new contract, because I do think that new contract, if he does sign it, would probably be just to add value to sell him on in, in January or next summer. And then we might get in over 100 million for him and then invest that in Dybala and have money left over. So it, it is a really difficult one, but I think at the moment I would take that straight swap. Uh, Gurney October saying, we need to make sure just to get a decent striker behind Kane because Liverpool and City are always 20 goals ahead of us. And also, if you want to go far, we need to put some pressure on Kane. Um, I think that is something that the club will be looking at, but I don't think it's a main priority getting that player behind Kane because we do have the likes of Son and Lucas who can fit in there and now Troy Parrott who seems to be breaking into the first team and has shown um, a lot of quality against Juventus and a bit against United I suppose as well um, but I think I don't think we need to aim to match Liverpool and City this season because they are so far ahead of us and they do have more financial uh, power than we do but uh, if we want to go far we need to put someone to put pressure on Kane um, I suppose he does have kind of a free reign in there that he knows if he's fit he'll play but I mean he, he, he does the job I know he misses a lot of chances but he gets into those positions so often that he doesn't need to score every time he gets the ball. Because if he misses two and then scores one, he still ends up being a 20, 25 goal a season player. And maybe competition would be good for him. Maybe a strike partner, which is what they were expecting Dybala to be. 
Um, there's so many different things that could work out for him, but I don't think that's a priority at the moment. Um, Darren saying, I heard Josh was spotted in Craven Cottage. Um, yeah, Joshua Anima was at uh, Fulham's preseason game yesterday. Um, some people are saying it is part of that Sessignon deal. Some are saying it's part of a separate deal because George Kevin and Kudu doesn't want to go to Fulham. So he might sell Anima. And another potential uh, thing happening there, someone said in this live chat, is that um, uh, if Rose stays this summer, we'll wait to sign Sessignon for free next summer. Um, and then Anima would just go to Fulham in a straight transfer this, this window. Um, Jimmy Page saying are you saying he's better than Ericsson based on last season though I really rate Ericsson and think he's a huge asset to the club uh, last season was a bit of a uh, an abnormality in Dybala's career because he it was kind of his first time having that that like I suppose second best player in the world in Cristiano Ronaldo playing ahead of him and he only scored five goals last season but you only have to look at his numbers before that to see that it was it wasn't some, that's not a good representation of the player he is it was a, an abnormality in the season before, he scored 22 goals. Um, and even the first season at Juventus, when he made the move from Palermo, he scored 19 goals. And making that first step up into a big team like that, that's an amazing return. And he has something like 58 goals in 127 games for them in all competitions. And as a player who can play in midfield as well, I think that's a really good stat. And he gets assists as well. And I think he just offers a bit more than Ericsson in that department and as well in terms of his experience in winning things as well. So while I do rate Ericsson, and I do think he is an asset to the club, I think a straight swap for Dybala... Uh, mainly because of that one year left on Ericsson's contract I do think at the moment that would be um, a good option for us um, George saying let's hope that Poch doesn't hype Troy Parrott like Marcus Edwards and that, that is really true um, Poch Gino does regret what he says about uh, what he said about Marcus Edwards he said that himself and I think he's learned his lesson and I don't think he will talk too much about Troy Parrott uh, being like the next Kane or something like that and I think that was evident even the interview after the it was one of the games, I can't remember which, but he was asked about whether or not we'd see Troy Parrott in the first team this, this season. And that almost kind of presented him with the opportunity to say, yeah, he's a great player, he's going to be the next big thing. But he kind of, he played it down a bit and said, if we don't have someone who can do it, if we don't sign a striker like Fernando Llorente or the rumour saying Andy Carroll, um, he said that Parrott could be in the, in the squad this season if he needs to be. And I think that's that's a very way, good way of putting it, putting it. He's not building it up too much, but he's also... You know, saying to Parrot, look, you, you might be in the squad this season. If you do what we know you can do, if you put the work in, you can be in the squad. And I think that was the best way to deal with that. So, as George said, I don't think he will uh, hype him up as much as he did Marcus Edwards. Um, Darren saying, I think there is more uh, question marks around Ali than Ericsson. Um, I think that is Ali's his, in, his inconsistencies in the way he's played uh, asks a lot of questions. Um, even though we do know he has the quality there but I think that's one of the reasons why he's not being linked with a move away from Tottenham and I think that could be not proof but maybe suggesting that Tottenham fans do think a lot more of him than what he actually does I know that has changed in the last couple of months but I think we do have to realise there are no teams who look to be interested in Ali um, so that, that maybe tells us what we need to know uh, Del Boy saying yep Delhi bench Lo Celso uh, Delhi on the bench for Lo Celso in the team this season um, Alex saying thinks think Ericsson's got a bit lazy, definitely swapping for Lo Celso. Um, maybe it's a straight player for player swap that could be, personally it's not something I would go for, but maybe it is an idea, but that's without a shadow of a doubt something that won't happen this summer. Ericsson, not a chance would he move to Real Betis. They're not even in European football this summer. So I think straight away that's something you can rule out. Um, Jimmy Page saying, yeah, Ericsson over Lo Celso. I disagree with that. I'd swap him for Dybala, but not Lo Celso. And 13th Monkey saying, Ericsson has lost his passion uh, for Spurs, in my opinion, similarly to Toby and maybe Rose too. Um, David Peter saying, could you please stop mentioning the Andy Carroll rumour, you're going to speak it into existence. Um, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm just saying what I've heard, I said yesterday, it's not something at all that I see happening. I'd I bet anything on him not joining Tottenham this summer, but look, it's one that's been mentioned. Um, it's a tr uh, transfer talk kind of thing, so I just thought I'd mention it. Um, Gurney saying, do you think we will go for Neres, David Neres or Danny van de Beek? Um, personally, I don't think we will. Uh, there was links to Danny van de Beek early in the window, but they quickly fell away, and he was kind of linked with uh, Bayern Munich, but at the moment it looks like he will be staying at Ajax. And as for David Neres, we've been linked in the last couple of days with a £54 million move for him. Um, but again, I don't think that's something that will happen. I think we're just... Um, I think it's just going to be either Lo Celso or Dybala at the moment, and personally I'd be happy with that. Neres, I know, is a great player, and coming through that Ajax system, he, he's going to have a lot of potential, and he's going to turn into a great player. But I just don't think it's going to happen for him this summer. Um, Delboy saying, people say Ericsson is lazy, but it's just his character. 
He's just a relaxed person. You can see that in every stat he runs the most in the team. And that is a great point. I do think Ericsson, he's, he's just a laid back person. Um, you can see that you know, kind of in his, in his interviews, he, he speaks you know, really slowly, really quietly. And even in those clips that the, they do for like the Tottenham YouTube and stuff like that, with the, you know, the players playing games and stuff like that, um, he never seems to be someone who gets particularly excited. And he's just a laid back character. And while I don't think he should bring that into his play in terms of you know, not running as much as he should, um, I suppose that could be a factor, as Del Boy says there. Um, Tottenham Reese saying the stream has gone on for nearly two hours now, Matt. That's long. Um, it actually doesn't feel like it's been that long. So now we're in 46. Um, Thomas saying, have you seen Sessegnon is injured? Not great, as we need him fit to sign him. Um, he's injured, but as Scott Parker said, he expects him to be back in, in uh, training before the season starts. So um, I wouldn't be too more too... Uh, too worried about that. Um, Jimmy Page saying, sorry, I'm just an Ericsson fanboy. He's done so much for us. And that's uh, fair. And I suppose I'd be the same. He's, uh, you know, someone who, who came in when we weren't at the, the best that we were, that we are now, I suppose. And we only signed him, you have to remember, for I think it was 12 million pounds. Uh, so like, I mean, the fact that he has become the player that he has is purely down to him and the team at Tottenham. Um, and that he's had so many important moments, so many important goals, uh, contributions that throughout the years, at, throughout his years at the club. And while at the moment he's not at his best form and he doesn't seem to be giving as much as he can, we have to remember and we have to appreciate what he has done for the club. Um, David Peter saying, I was just kidding, you do a great job and it's much appreciated. It looks like you're going to get to 1k subscribers before the season starts, so well done. Uh, thanks for that, David. I was, I know, it's just, uh, just explaining my thinking, I suppose. Um, Jay Spur is saying, Matt, do you think the pressure for us to win a trophy grows over time? I hate hear hearing Kyle Walker speak about leaving the club to win, but you can sympathise to some extent. Um... Without a shadow of a doubt, the pressure grows over time because the longer we go without a trophy, uh, the more of a talking point it is and the more there's going to be people outside of Tottenham uh, doubting what's going on at the club and doubting people like Pochettino. And I think for us, maybe it is important to get a, a trophy soon. Maybe it's not. Maybe we do just have to uh, focus on continuously building the club and offering more in the Premier League and the Champions League because at the end of the day, that is the ultimate goal. And Pochettino himself has said that. What he, he doesn't want... His, well, not that he doesn't want, but his... His goal at the club just isn't to win an FA Cup and leave it at that. He ultimately wants the Premier League and Champions League. And it seems almost that, in a way, he's willing to bypass those domestic cups and move straight for the big goal. And even though it'll take longer, um, maybe it is a better way to do things if that's the way he wants to do it. As I said before, we do have to trust him. And uh, we do just have to assume that he knows what's best for the club. Um, Alex saying, if Ericsson was any more laid back, he'd be in a coma. <laughs> um... Now here, how come the deals for Lo Celso and Sessegnon are taking long to complete? As I said, I just imagine it's the, the fine details in the contracts, in the uh, deals to sign uh, with the transfer fees and stuff with the club, the personal terms and stuff with the agents like that, and then the side of things actually getting them like working visas and all that stuff. I think it's just the finer details in those contracts that's holding it back at the moment, but maybe also the links to like so Dybala held up that Lo Celso deal, um, I'm not too sure. Um... Like, how long can we keep players like Kane and Eriksen or even Ali for? Um, I think they're so invested in what's going on in the squad at the moment. I don't think we have to worry about uh, too many of them leaving. Obviously, with Eriksen's comments, maybe he is someone who will leave in the next year or so. But Kane is so dedicated. He's so passionate about what's going on at Tottenham. And he's just so invested in it. I don't think he's going to leave until maybe towards the end of his career. He might move on to the MLS or China or something like that. Um, Ali, he's not someone I'm worried about leaving at all. He seems to just love the club so much. And you can see that in like the passion he has and stuff like that. So I wouldn't be worried about Ali leaving. Delboy saying, I'm a bit of an Ericsson fanboy. The guy is so gifted and technically our best player by a mile. Such a better footballer than Delhi. You can see how smart he is. Now that is true. Like Ericsson has that that just footballing genius that it's it's so hard to find in a player and it's not something you can teach. And while it doesn't always uh, materialise to the quality on the pitch, he is without a doubt our most technically gifted player. Um... Uh, 13th Monkey saying maybe these new signings will inject some more passion into Ericsson and Ali and that's true I do agree with that I think bringing in that competition in that area it might inject more passion in them but it'll inject, inject more uh, determination and they, they know they have to fight for the place rather than being safe in that starting 11 um, David Peter saying why is everyone bashing Ericsson if we were to let go of anyone to make space in the attack my votes would be Lamella poor injury record and then Delhi, although they wouldn't get as much as Christian um, I think Lamella is one that the fans are just kind of getting a bit fed up with now. He's um, been here for about six or seven years and signed with the likes of Ericsson, uh, Soldado, Kirakesh, Kapu, that famous seven that came in when Bale left. And 
he, he's never quite lived up to what we expected from him and he has shown glimpses of his quality but unfortunately it just hasn't quite happened for him and while I personally I don't want to see him go I don't think it would be the end of, wor- end of the world if he did go um, Gurney saying I'm worried about Trippier being gone and also mentioned about Rose also I think we should let not let Rose go because he's one of the best at the moment and he's a, a yeah I mean he's like he has showed a lot of quality and stuff in the team uh, this uh, Kieran Trippier now to start with he has shown a lot of quality when he was there and that season that first season at Wembley he, he was one of our best players and he as that fullback showed just how important a quality fullback is in that system for us and then he went on to the World Cup and he was one of the best players there I mean he had the best numbers in the World Cup in terms of crosses uh, chances created passing and all that stuff um, as for Danny Rose as I said I want, I want him to stay at the club he's someone who loves the club and we love him back and he's a quality player and is the perfect fit to that soil that we play in the, in the left back position um, Jay Spurs is saying real big question what is Ali's best position and as George says behind the striker playing in that number 10 role where he makes those late bursts those late runs into the box seems to be where he is most effective and I think with him where he like he's kind of the reason for his own downfall when he tries to overcomplicate things he tries to you know not make a player and then you know pick a 40 yard cross field pass or something like that but I think if he just kept it to the basics and did what he can do uh, without trying to overcomplicate things I think he'd be a much better player and I imagine that's something that Pochettino will try and get into him uh, if his consistency doesn't improve um, Delboy saying I would agree about Lamella his injuries are ridiculous now when we need him to come in and perform he's injured definitely a mid-table player uh, yeah I mean you can't blame him for his injuries but he has picked up so many and I mean, it's just, it's just not happening for him at the club, unfortunately. Like when he does when he does come into the team, he is a good addition because you can see how much he cares. You can see the passion and the determination he has, and he will chase down any ball to the end of the earth. And it's important to have a player like that in the squad. But at the end of the day, we need quality. We want to win trophies. We don't need a player who will like you know a Shane Long type of player who will just chase down everything. We need a player with quality. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Lamella is that uh, definitely a mid table player. I would say he's more of a a European player like he played with those uh, top four teams in Italy like obviously he came from Roma where he was just that but I think I don't think he's a mid-table player he's someone who will do well in a, a top four team somewhere in Europe um, Lamella had a great last season he was on fire um, I would say he had a great season but it was probably his best um, since he came to the club he seems to be improving slowly year on year but it's just not enough to to consider him as was a first team player and a, a crucial part to our, to our team Gurdy saying, do you think they will let Eric Dyer go or will we use him again? Um, I think he could be one that we might try and keep at the club this season because of the versatility in terms of he can play in that holding midfield role, he can play centre-back and he I suppose, started uh, at Sporting Lisbon as a right-back. Um, so I don't think he's someone that will leave. Um, if he does, it won't be the end of the world. He's not, I suppose, a starting player. But I think we could use him in that uh, rotation of the squad and uh, uh, as, as a sub if he's needed. Um... Now David about Lamella saying I agree but his injury or is that about I think it's about Lamella I agree but his injury record is so woeful um, it's true but again we can't we can't blame him for that we have to like I was commiserate with him to some extent that he his career is being so tar- uh, not tarnished but affected by these injuries and we can't take it out on him because at the end of the day it's not his fault 13th Monkey saying Lamella is a good squad player gives 100% at the very least when fit um, that's true as I said he he chased down every ball uh, as far as he possibly can and he's not a starting player maybe squad player is um, in our club the kind of max that he will reach um, Jay Spurs saying Eric Dyer is on the decline uh, Jimmy Page saying I love Eric Dyer Eric Dyer loves me but he <laughs> doesn't want him to stay um, yeah he's I mean he's not quite lived up to what he, he showed us in that first couple of seasons when he was as I've said, in, along, in alongside Moussa Dembele, maybe he looked a lot better than he actually was. But uh, as Delvoy here says, Dyer can play centre-back or centre-defensive mid, but both terribly. Um, <laughs> maybe not terribly, but not with as much quality as you might expect him to. Um, there's a lot of differing opinions about Eric Dyer. A lot of people want him to leave, but again, he's someone that I feel like cares about the club and he's a, a main part of that kind of the camaraderie in the dressing room. Um I don't want him to leave, but again, it wouldn't be the end of the end of the world if he did. Thirteenth monkey didn't Poch say Dyer will be a top centre back one day. Um, I'm not sure if he did, but I mean the potential was there at one stage. It definitely was. Um, 
unfortunately he hasn't lived up to it again he's had injuries as well um, that have affected that and I, I think he, he's never going to make it as a first team player at Tottenham again but similarly to Lamella he's a good squad player and if he's there he will offer something in that in terms of depth and stuff like that but if he leaves I mean it won't be something we'd be mad about he, he'll, someone that we won't want to see go but it won't be the end of the world uh, if and when he does uh, Tarek here saying sell Wanyama I think if he were to sell one of Dyer or Wanyama uh, I think Wanyama might be the better option because he suffers a lot more from injuries and when he does get into the team he is he is such a good player and he's, he's so strong he's so powerful but unfortunately it seems to be that whenever he is in he does get injured and um, I think it would, would be better to let him go because they're two similar players in the middle of the park in terms of they, they do add a bit of quality but not enough to get into the first team so then I think you have to uh, take into account what else they offer and Dyer just offers that versatility that Wanyama doesn't have so personally I would say if we were to let one of them go it would be Wanyama um, Daniel's saying no one has given me a proper reason why Rose needs to go um, yeah I don't think there is uh, at the moment a proper official reason for why he's going to leave um, it might be because of the division Pochettino has over the next five years in terms of what he's going to have in left and right back uh, which I think for what, what's making Rose leave could be the same as what made Trippier leave um, obviously we don't know what it is but uh, we don't really know what it is that uh, um, what is uh, kind of pushing Rose towards the door but I'm sure whatever it is there's, there are good reasons for it I, mean, I keep coming back to it we have to trust Pochettino um, Tottenham Reese saying sell Suzoko for 250 million um, I mean, if we got an offer for that I'm sure we'd accept it but uh, not realistic I'd say now uh, Sean saying with less than two weeks to go do you foresee any surprise late signing particularly in our fullback area Danny Alves perhaps as I said, I do think we will make another signing on top of Lacelso and Sessegnon. I don't know who it is or what position it's going to be, but I just I feel like uh, three additions to the team for the upcoming season isn't going to be enough, and we will need another one. And I think Daniel Levy will see that the the same way. Um, I don't think it's going to be a full back because we'll get in Sessegnon, and the club aren't believed to be after a right back at the moment. So I don't think Danny Alves uh, will come in. And even if we were looking for a right back, I don't think Alves is a realistic option. Um, and I would like to see him at the club because of just what he has done in his career and I suppose the bit that he can offer now but I don't think um, I don't think we will be signing a right back or Danny Alves this summer Gurney saying guys stop hating on Lamella he can't help for the injuries that he is getting he's a really good player just that just the passion and commitment and look at Suzoko we gave him another chance as well um, yeah you're right about Lamella injury is not his fault and it's just the main thing that's uh, keeping him out of the team at the moment um, but I think we gave Lamella a lot more time than we gave Suzoko yeah, people were calling for Suzoko to be sold last summer after only one year, and Lamella now has had a, a long time to try and make it, and he just hasn't. I don't think I don't want him to be sold, but um, I do think we we have given him a lot of chances, and I don't think he's going to make it as a, a first team player at Tottenham. Dan is saying Rose leaving and Sessegnon coming means three at the back, and that doesn't work for us. Um, I don't think it does because Sessegnon plays as a left back as well, so he can play in that position as well. Dave is signing that new five year contract. Um, I don't think it would be uh, a suggestion that we're going to be playing three at the back. And judging from what we played in pre-season already, we played that 4-2-3-1 and the diamond in midfield in a 4-1-2-1-2. So I think going ahead, four at the back is what Pochettino is going to be using. And um, so as you said, that three at, the, three at the back doesn't work for us too well. Four at the back is the ideal thing. Um, George saying, Matt, have you heard of the right back Atal from Nice? Very good player at the age of 23. Um, I've heard of him, but I don't know too much about him. But as I've said, right back isn't something the club is looking to sign this summer. So um, I wouldn't really entertain the possibility of us getting him in. Spurs 13 saying, do you think Sessegnon will still come despite Scott Parker's comments? Um, I think he will because Parker's comments seem to have been taken out of context. He said he expects uh, Sessegnon to come back to pre-season training because he's injured at the moment. So he expects him to be training back before the season starts. But the, the media took that as uh, Scott Parker saying... He expects he fully expects Sessegnon to be at the club this season. Um, I, I I still think that that deal is going to go through. I don't think he'll be at Fulham. And from Fulham's point of view, he has refused to sign a new contract. And with only one year left, they they have to get something back from him. They can't just let him go for free next summer because he's so young and he's so much potential. I think they, they do need to just cash in now and get what they can from him. Um, regular Joe saying when Yama was poor, even when healthy last season. Um, I don't think he was ever 100% match fit. Like There were talks of when he was playing, he was getting injections to kind of deal with the pain and stuff like that. So I don't think he was ever fully fit last season. And that's personally why I would uh, potentially see him leaving this summer. Uh, Jimmy Page says, De Depends on Lamella's wages. I think he's worth keeping, even though he was out for so long. I think he's a great player. 
Um, I can't imagine Lamella's wages are too high because it's been a while now since he signed a new contract. So I would be sh- I would be shocked if they're anything near a hundred thousand pounds a week. Um, so he, he's not uh, exactly putting too much weight in the wage book, but. Uh, as you said, I, I think he's worth keeping. He's a great player and he does offer something to the team even though it's not first team quality. Um, 13th Monkey saying, can't play Diamond 4-4-2 without quality fullbacks. Potch saw that against United recently and that's exactly true. It's something I touched on as well. Even though in that game it was, like in the first half it was Georgie with Kyle Walker-Peters and throughout the second half it was it seemed to be Harvey White playing out there and then Juan Foyth played and right back for a bit until uh, I think someone else came on and Foyth pushed into the middle. I think it was George Marsh actually pushed out into right back. So I don't think we can take that as a good representation on where we are in that system because of the players that we're playing. Um, there's way too much dependence on those inexperienced players who just don't have the quality to be playing at that level yet. Um, so you're 100% right saying quality fullbacks are really important in that because with that diamond in midfield, it's it's adding an extra man in there and then we're putting an extra man up front which takes from the two, the two wingers that would essentially be playing behind the striker. So it's a very narrow system and it puts a lot of dependence on those fullbacks because, you know, they're... We need them. We need them getting forward and getting in the wide positions when we're on the attack. And then defensively, of course, we need them because you know they're defenders. Um, Daniel saying spending sixty plus million on Ndombele, then more on Celso and having Davis and Walker Peters. That makes no sense. Um, I I I wouldn't agree because getting Ndombele in, he's it's not the position that we desperately needed to improve on, but he is a fantastic player and he's an amazing addition to the squad. Lo Celso, I think we do need that competition in behind the striker to get more out of the likes of Ericsson and Ali, and of course adding a quality player in there as well. But Davis and Walker Peters won't be our starting fullbacks going into the season. It will be either Rose or Sessignon and Aurier or Foyth. So I think we are stronger in that position than those two, but um, I agree that we probably should have prioritised, especially right back as someone to sign this season because of Kieran Trippier's departure. Um, Jimmy Page saying, What about Lorente? Do you think we should be trying to keep him or is offering him a lower wage a good idea? I would love to see Llorente stay at the club this summer and I've said that from the moment we heard he was on our release players list. He's someone who does offer a lot to the team when, when he comes on to replace Kane, comes on late in games. Even the few games that he started, he did well. I, mean, I, I think he got a hat-trick in one game there. Um, I forget who it was against, but it was in the cup against a smaller team. But I think with him, he'd have more benef- uh, benefits in the long run in terms of him going into a coaching role in the club and even in the training this season, helping out players like Troy Parrott, uh, Kazea Sterling. I think he could even teach Harry Kane a thing or two because at the end of the day he's like 10 years older than Kane so I think he'd be really good more to help the players that are there rather than um, adding quality to the team and I just want to remind you that I'm running a Facebook group uh, after I publish this video I'll leave a link to that in the description um, I'm also going to be doing a fantasy football league that's up and running already if you do want to join uh, the code is 8MTEKC I'll just put it into the, the live chat there 8MTEKC um, I'll put that down in the description after I publish the video as well. Um, that's all I'm going to have time for today. Um, I've really enjoyed taking your questions and comments in the live chat. Um, I'm going to try and do these as much as possible for the next 10 days uh, until the window closes. Um, so if you want to get more live streams like this, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when I go live and also when I upload different videos. Um, thanks to everyone who watched and who's liked this video and left comments. Uh, thanks for watching.